Plus, Euphoria, the buzzy show about a group of troubled teens, raked up 16 Emmy nominations this year. We spoke with the cast about how their characters evolved this season. And we'll wrap things up with the late, great James Caan from Our Vault on one of his most iconic films, Misery. But first, here's today's pop start with Jacob. Let's do some pop start. All right, first up, we've got an exclusive first look at the upcoming Princess Diana documentary, simply called The Princess. The film's going to give viewers an intimate look at Diana's life and how her relationship with Prince Charles came under intense scrutiny from the media and the public. Watch us. The princess has been the best thing to happen to the monarchy in centuries. Did you get a chance to see her? Yes! Diana is very big news everywhere. She's got the common touch. The prince realizes that he's taking second place. By the way. <laughs> a hollow and tormented marriage are giving the British media and its public little else to talk about. Please give me one question, right? No. She's been pushed from the word go. It's the media that's causing the problems. Please. Leave them alone. Should this mean so much to us? Can't sweep her under the carpet. It's the cool 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 <laughs> Love the Dawson's Creek. Uh, we got some news on a possible revival of the popular 90s teen drama that starred Katie Holmes and James Vanderbeek, Michelle Williams, Joshua Jackson. The news is this is not fair. It's likely never going to happen. <laughs> Sorry. Bring it up. I don't know. I just wanted to let you guys know. Uh, Holmes was asked whether she would like to return to the role that made her a household name. She had some disappointing news for fans. This is what she said. I think it's great that you're nostalgic for it. So am I. But it's like, do we want to see them not at that age? Mm. I don't know. I don't think so. We all decided we don't, actually. Okay, there you go. Pretty That's pretty definitive. definitive. I don't want to know what happened to them, like, as adults. Did you love Katie Holmes? Oh, my Come gosh. on. Yeah, yeah. Is that you was your crush? crush? I would go that was your crush. I'd be like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> it was so good. Uh, okay, next up, Lizzo. Uh, how was the show? It was an absolutely incredible. Fresh off uh, being here and her hit song about damn time, hitting number one on the Billboard Hot 100. The music superstar is revealing just how many times she recorded that song's chorus to make it perfect. She posted a TikTok video of the moment that she nailed it with members of her team celebrating. Check it out. Huh. The moment I finally figured out the chorus to about damn time. Let's celebrate. I got a feeling I'm gonna be okay. Okay. That's so cool. <laughs> Is that amazing? Oh, that's awesome. Is that amazing? That's so fun. she wrote in the caption, we literally had 50 versions of this song. I never thought we'd finish it, oh. but it was worth it. Can you imagine being in that room? Do you remember when she was here, I won't forget, when she was greeting all the people in the crowd and this little girl looked at her and said, I love you, Lizzo. And Lizzo said, I love you. But do you love you? Oh. oh. She said, yes. I was Whoa. like, I love that Lizzo. Oh She's amazing. Gosh. I bet that kid will never forget that moment. Yeah, I, had, I was texting all of you. I had fun about that day. That was yeah. like one of the good ones. Also, the year. entire yeah. album is great. Yeah. That is great. Album yeah. every track. Well, if it wasn't enough, she also showed a video uh, showing off a bouquet of flowers, by the way, that Harry Styles <gasps> sent her way as a congratulations Aww. for about damn time. It actually surpassed, dethroned as it was oh, on the Bill Oh, his song. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. classic. I love Harry Styles. Mm -hmm. All right, coming up next, have you ever been watching Seinfeld? This is all about me, guys. <laughs> uh, and thought to yourself, boy, I wish I could have that marble rye bread or that famous big salad. Yeah. Well, now you can, thanks to the release of the official <laughs> oh, Seinfeld cookbook. No. Yes, it features recipes from some of the show's oh classic God. food moments, from the black and white yeah. cookie to the infamous soup Nazis what? Mulligatani. Um, uh... <laughs> oh, 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 one Mulligatani, and um, you know what? Does, has anyone ever told you you look exactly like Al Pacino? You know, scent of a woman. <laughs> Very good. Very good. You know something? <laughs> no soup for you! Come back. One year. One year. One year. One year. <laughs> no soup for you. Yosef was so excited for that one. I said Mulligatani. He's like, we're doing Seinfeld? Uh, you don't have to worry about following the soup Nazis rules because you can make the Mulligatani That's right awesome. at home. Wow. So October 11th, cool. the okay. cookbook comes out, so That's go pick fun. that one so up. Fun. Okay, last but not least, the most unexpected story of the morning. Aaron Rodgers <laughs> rolled into Packers training camp this week looking like a movie, actually like a movie character. 
Look, here he is walking into camp, rocking <laughs> long hair, oh. a beard, a white tank top, light blue jeans. Does he remind you of anybody? Nick Cage. Nick Cage, oh, Nick Cage. baby, Con Air. Packers fans and yeah. Nick Cage fans <laughs> caught on pretty quickly. He was channeling Cage's character, wow. Cameron Poe, right. from the 1997 Con Air. Con Air. Yep. It was no coincidence. He posted photos of Cage on his own Instagram, too, so he did this on purpose. And it's not the first time he's done something like this. Last season, Rogers grew out his hair a lot, and it turns out it was for his Halloween costume. So he went as Keanu Reeves, uh, John Wick, complete with the dog and everything. So wow. he commits. He commits, he commits. yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, that's your pop that's star, it. guys. Yeah, I will great. take it. I know. We're you like, want, we want more. more. Guys, can we get a couple more? Yeah. yeah. Hey, well, way to go. Way to go, Jake. <laughs> We've got one more pop star story for you this morning. Get ready for more Ryan Gosling and The Gray Man. The Netflix action film may have just premiered on Netflix, but a sequel starring Gosling is already in the works from the same directors. Not only that, but it seems the streamer is trying to turn this into a whole sort of spy cinematic universe with a spin-off being worked on as well. The Gray Man follows Gosling's CIA agent character as he's hunted by assassins across the globe Looks like audiences liked what they were seeing with a reported 88 million hours viewed over the weekend. That's a huge number for Netflix. And those are your Pop Start Plus headlines. Still to come, Bonnie Hunt's visit to the third hour. Stay with us. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas or my birthday or something. <laughs> Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Pop Star Plus. Bonnie Hunt wears many hats in the new Apple TV Plus show, Amber Brown. Executive producer, director, writer, and showrunner. And she dropped by the third hour to chat about the new project. Our next guest is an Emmy and Golden Globe nominated actor who has starred on the big and small screen. Ah, uh, yes, Bonnie Hunt rolled some magical dice in the original Jumanji. Then she took multitasking to another level as a mom of 12 and cheaper by the dozen. And for her latest project, Bonnie's behind the camera directing the new Apple TV Plus series, Amber Brown, about a young girl navigating life after her parents' divorce. Here's a look. <laughs> You sure you're fine with spending the night somewhere else, away from home, even with school the next morning? Yes, absolutely, for sure. <laughs> and I can wear these PJs that Dad sent me. <laughs> I mean, wear them, like, show up in them. Cute, right? Yes, this is <laughs> very sweet. Oh, I'm so excited! Cutie. Bonnie, good morning to you. Good it's morning. so good to see you. You too, Jake. You know what I want to do? I want to say hi to Ashley first, who's Thank watching you. us right now, your niece. Yep. Say good morning to you and good morning to Ashley. We know she's a big fan. Yes, you, and Ashley. she's, you know, a cancer patient right now, my beautiful niece, and she's in the emergency room watching us because her white count is up. All the cancer patients out there know what I'm talking about when you're going through chemo and you have that white count go up. It's a little scary, but... Um, well, we hope we can be a yes. little hug for her in the morning. Yes, and, and, and all of you, anybody out there fighting it, you know, yeah. just know you're a warrior and um, our energy is with you, mine Absolutely. and Ashley's. Sending good. lots of love to you, Absolutely. Ashley. Yeah. All right, so let's talk about Amber Brown. We're very excited. Mm -hmm. And it was based on a book series, as I mentioned. Uh, a girl's going through a lot of changes in her life, including a, her parents' divorce. What else? Tell us a little more. 
Well, it's really about, I mean, just talking about my niece, you know, I have a bunch of nieces and nephews, and of course, I'm close to all of them. Ashley was born when I was working at Second City mm -hmm. back in the days, and uh, my whole family's been a big part of the show, because so much of it is personal for me, even though it's based on the books from Paula Danzinger. The family was kind enough to let me explore and heighten the characters and bring them into present day. And Amber, the whole show is for the whole family. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking about it before we were on the air, just, uh, Actually, I try to write from my heart and with humor, like my mom instilled in me and I it's been so much fun to kind of share my family's sense of humor and love through this series and I hope it touches it people. Comes through. We talked a little bit about your mom we're so sorry to hear of your loss I know how close you are but I know that it was important to her for you to address family different mm. issues in family and would yeah. she have just love oh, this so there's much? Mom there with is. her pies yeah um yeah, yeah. it you know I'm um I think a part of me will always be grieving the loss of my mom. Mm. Sorry. Oh. But, um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm inspired by her constantly, and she'd always talk to me about the ripple effect. You know, you're a storyteller, Bonnie. Remember the ripple effect. Be mindful, because what you put out there has an effect on people. You're doing it. So I was watching it yesterday, and it's the kind of show you can watch with your kids, and it's okay. It feels like a safe space. Yeah. Talk to me about this Amber Brown, this main mm -hmm. character. She had me at hello. Yeah. She is, I was just like, where did they find this little girl? Yeah. Well, adorable. you know, we had a great casting team, brought us everybody, and I was telling you before the break that, I mean, before we were on that um, we didn't put any descriptions of our characters you know we just said mother daughter just that kind of thing and a, and a personality and we were able to see so many people and then we you know the minute Carson was on screen my mom was actually That's her name, Carson Carson Rose so and mom and I were watching on zoom you know I was doing all the auditions on zoom at that time during right. the pandemic and Carson came on the screen and my mom and I looked at each other just when she was just talking because I always talk to the kids mm -hmm. instead of have them just read the script and yeah she was delightful and charismatic and authentic and she could feel the heart of the character and that Great. was most important to me and she's phenomenal Bonnie, sorry, but I got to go through your IMDb because oh, we've got so you many. You and every guy on the so, planet. <laughs> so many good ones. Dave, Jerry Maguire. Yeah. Uh, you had your own TV show. You had your own daytime talk show. We were thinking, is there something? When are you going to finally you? succeed? For, oh, no, <laughs> stop. Give me a break. What's stick? Is there, what ties it all together for you? Ooh. Uh, storytelling and and the how magical. Uh, storytelling is when I you know I'm an oncology nurse former oncology nurse but I still work as a volunteer advocate and my time at the hospital I would see people facing their own mortalities and in a moment we would watch something on TV together and I'd see them completely free for mm. a second mm. and I realized even as a child my dad would watch the Andy Griffith show all of a sudden the pressure of having seven children and being a blue-collar guy he'd be laughing and escape right. for a moment so that's really powerful and I hope my writing whether it was Return to Me which I wrote or all my talk shows or TV shows whatever it is my energy is oh can I have that effect on somebody at home right now escape. So, you right? do it's you good. do man it's great oh, to spend right time with you it's so Bonnie. great to see you here yes. yeah, Bonnie thank you so much everybody Amber Brown debuts on Apple TV plus this Friday you got to go check it out great to hear from Bonnie up next Zendaya and her euphoria castmates Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on yes. this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it.
it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Who will meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were going to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? We are back with a fan favorite. Euphoria did especially well with this year's Emmy nominations. The show tallied 16 in all, including a Best Actress nod for star Zendaya. We spoke to her and the rest of the cast about how their high school characters navigate addiction, identity, love, and more in the most recent season. I had to choose three words to describe Euphoria. A lot of words that could describe Euphoria, but chaotic, funny, and honest. Painful, tiring, love. Listen. It's a it's a very different season, to be honest. I mean, um, tonally, it's different. Um, I think it's far more emotional than the first season. Um, I think it's got much like the film stock that we use this season, which is also different. Um, it's it's high contrast, meaning the highs are high, the lows are low, and when it's funny, it's really funny, and when it's painful, it's really painful. I think uh, they're in a kind of tough position just because after they're falling out at the end of season one, Rue relapses as we find out very quickly and Jules is in, in the loop and doesn't know. While they do like reconvene, um, there's like a lot under the surface that will most likely bubble up and bring the former issues to surface again, which is going to be tough for them because I think like surface level feelings, they just want to be like cute couple, but you know, it's, it's more complicated than that. I think Leslie is that tough love mom. You know, she loves her girls. She'll do anything for them. And unfortunately, she finds herself in the thick of Rue's addiction. And she she wants to save her daughter. But unfortunately, sometimes those situations, the person has to make up their own mind to become sober and to become clean and to want to be better. And I think Leslie is doing everything she can. So we see her kind of make some hard decisions and I think I think Leslie is just your ride or die mom. She's like, look, we, we're gonna we're gonna get through this together. So, you slept over last night. Yeah. So, are you two in a relationship? Mm, yeah, kinda. I think with all of the characters, I am um, lucky enough or blessed enough to be able to to step in their shoes. I try to do just that. I try to become them and, and really uh, try to tell their story. But with Gia specifically, I think it's just been us kind of growing up together where I was around 15 when we were shooting the first season and now I'm 18. But there has been growth and there has been more understanding of what Rue is going through and her addiction and her mental health. But Gia has to realize that she is human and she has the right to not neglect her own feelings and all of this. So I think we, we get to see her grow up and I've grown up with her. So um, I've just been, been super duper grateful that I have been able to play a character um, that is so real and is so grounded and that isn't perfect. So um, I'm lucky. What if these are like the big moments in life? Like my mom always talks about how high school is like this big monumental part of her life. 
and I cannot imagine being 40 and looking back at this like, wow. I think one of my most favorite parts of playing Cassie, her choices are very unexpected. And I enjoy the challenge of going on a roller coaster with a character like that. So yes, it's a challenge, but I find that part the most fun. My favorite part about playing Maddie is I have a lot of fun with Maddie. I think she can be such a fun character, you know, when she's in her element and in her feminine power. I think a challenging part about playing Maddie is everything that she has to, just everything she has to go through is heartbreaking. I get a little too connected sometimes. The most challenging part about playing Ali is in the beginning, it was to not be seduced, to feel like you have to be a part of that bigger picture of the other craziness and all that. But I can actually be a bit more grounded. And I think to understand that that's my engine. It is not to play all these big notes of emotion and all that, but it's actually to be a bit more restrained. And so that was a challenge, to be honest. Every actor asks, w wishes to be written with such dimension and colors and arc for a whole episode mm -hmm. and calls on their, their strengths and calls on things that they feel very close to. And I think it was this great symbiosis, actually, that great gift that Sam gave me. Um, and so that's been my greatest gift. And I feel like the effect of it has been a gift that keeps on giving on how it's affecting people's lives and people saying, I feel like I'm not alone. Or I feel like you reached out a hand to me or I listen to, I watch it over and over again, because it's it's going to my soul and helping me get through these dark spaces. So that's the gift that I've been given. It's an honor to be a part of uh, creating a piece of art in such a huge collaboration and every moving part, you know, it's just insane the scale of, of what we're doing. The trip. Uh, yeah, you know, you can't even put that feeling into words. It's incredible. I feel incredibly grateful to me when people have come up to, to me at least, and shared their stories, whether it be of sobriety or other entry points to different characters that they feel connected to emotionally. That's when I'm like, you know, this, this is worth it. Like what we're doing means something to somebody and that's all we could ever really hope for. That's the point, you know, that's the purpose. If you haven't watched or want to watch again, you can catch up on Euphoria on HBO. Still to come, we are remembering James Caan with a moment from our vault on one of his greatest films, Misery. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. From New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to Pop Start Plus. The entertainment world was shaken when James Caan passed away earlier this month at the age of 82. Today, we'd like to remember his great acting legacy. He visited today back in 1990 to talk about his film, Misery, starred alongside Kathy Bates, who went on to win an Oscar for her performance. Over the years, the books of Stephen King have made for some pretty scary movies, among them The Shining, Carrie, Salem's Lot, Cujo, Firestarter, Creepshow, 
The latest edition of the list is called Misery. It opens nationwide this week. And our man in Hollywood, Jim Brown, says it brings together an unlikely mix of talents. If it were a true story, it would end up on the front pages of supermarket tabloids. Headline screaming, celebrity author terrorized by biggest fan. But it's only fiction. It's misery from the mind of best-selling novelist Stephen King and brought to the movie screen by writer William Goldman and director Rob Reiner. The romance novelist turned prisoner is James Kahn, whose film credits include Cinderella Liberty, Funny Lady, Comes a Horseman, Gardens of Stone, and of course, his Oscar-nominated performance as Sonny Corleone in the original Godfather. Kathy Bates plays his number one fan, Nurse Annie Wilkes, who goes from sympathetic lifesaver to sociopathic demon. I want my pain to go away, Annie. Please, make it go away. I think it was a sadistic joke by Rob. You know, he says, let's get the most hyper guy in Hollywood. <laughs> let's get Jimmy and tie him down, you know. You know, ha, ha, ha. You know, every morning he would laugh. How, how about this scene you get in bed, Jimmy, you know. So, yeah, that's, that, it, it became, of all the, the pics I've done, and I've done a lot of physical things, you know. And I, but this was the most physical demanding, physically demanding, uh, picture because of that, you know, because I was forced not to move. This subject of uh, of the obsessive fan, have you ever encountered anything even remotely like this or known any actor who has? I've really not had uh, any anything remotely close to, to this or anything that touched on uh, on violence. Plus, you know, who's going to fool around with Sonny Corleone? You know what I mean? That's the way they <laughs> hey, what are you gonna do? Nice college boy, huh? Didn't want to get mixed up in the family business? Huh? Now you want to gun down a police captain? Why, because he slapped you in the face a little bit? Huh? What do you think, this is the army where you shoot him a mile away? You gotta get up close like this, and bada bing, you blow their brains all over your nice side relief suit. James Caan was Sonny Corleone in Francis Ford Coppola's masterful version of the novel The Godfather. Caan, along with Al Pacino and Robert Duvall, were nominated for supporting Oscars, but lost to Joel Gray in Cabaret. Khan also lost out for any chance to grow old with other members of the family when his character was killed off in spectacular fashion. Now, with Coppola's Godfather III due in theaters next month, Khan, who also worked for Coppola in The Rain People and Gardens of Stone, wished the movie maker well. Oh, I have nothing but well wishes for, for Godfather III. You know, Francis uh, Coppola, of course, is been a friend for a long, long time. And uh, I always root for him. Uh, I don't think they need much help. I don't think they need my wishes even. I think it'll be just great. And there was Rocket Man trying to get out. And here comes the cliff. And just before the car went off the cliff, he jumped free. Meanwhile, James Caan has his own problems with the dilemma provided by Kathy Bates in Misery, which opens this week. Too much as to say that as they hope for an audience, misery loves company. No, shouldn't do that. 56 pass. James Kahn, such a legend. We're thinking of his family and his friends. That does it for this edition of Pop Start Plus. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. Join us again tomorrow for more. We'll see you then.
Okay, I have been bursting, bursting to talk to Viola Davis. She is, to me, just stunning. The kind of person you want to get to know on so many levels. Yes, she is arguably one of the most talented actors in the business, winner of an Academy Award, and now she's only a Grammy away from having the coveted EGOT, the Emmy, Grammy, Oscar, and Tony. But I couldn't wait to hear from Viola, the woman, the one who survived an unthinkable childhood, the one who witnessed abuse and endured hardships so painful, few people would have survived. But Viola, she overcame, she persevered, and she grew. How? She talks about all of it in her new memoir, Finding Me. Just talking to Viola, I wept in admiration, in awe, and in celebration. Hi, Hoda. I can't. I can't. I can't. <laughs> I can't. Wait. It's highlighted. It's dog-eared. I bound your book, the PDF, and made a little book out of it so I could carry it with me. Oh. Can I just tell you something? It is so meaningful and beautiful oh. and touching and... Um, I don't even know how to describe it, but it moved me to my very core. Thank to you. To my very core. It's so incredible. I mean, Thank I, you, I thought I knew you, and then I read this. <laughs> and now I'm like, wow. I'm so moved. And I'm also kind of mad at myself because I've interviewed so, you so many times, and I realized I must not have ever asked the right questions because <laughs> this book is just so full of you. So let me ask you how it feels during this moment. Here you are, you've put your life on the page and you're handing yeah. it out like a piece of your heart and you're mm -hmm. saying, this is me. Yes. Um, how does that part feel in this moment? Terrifying, it really does. It's a lot of, it's a lot of fear, you know, because I'm putting my life out there for the world to uh, judge, observe, you, you know, it's it, it's like that old saying, I, I know what I said, I just don't know what you heard. And I know what I wrote, I just don't know how it's going to be received. And I think that that is really ultimately what happens when you make yourself vulnerable. It's like running naked in a crowded stadium. So it's terrifying. Well, it is um, so full of, of heart and soul. Let me just start by saying, and I think I speak for a lot of people in America, I did not know what you have endured in your life as a young yeah. girl. I knew that you had struggles. I did not know you grew up hungry. What does that mean to grow up hungry? The hunger was just one part of it. It's growing up hungry. It's growing up um, exposed to that level of abuse. It's growing up feeling like an outsider. The thing about being hungry is you don't think about anything else. You get to school at eight, by 8.15 you're falling asleep. You're listening to people who say, oh, my mom made me breakfast this morning, I didn't want that cereal. And you're thinking, you didn't eat your cereal? You had cereal with milk? You know, your brain um, chemistry changes, how you perceive the world changes. And I'll tell you the worst part of all of it is the deep, deep shame. Huh. Because how do you tell someone that you're hungry? Huh. How, do you, how, how do you say that to a teacher who's worried about maybe your grades, how you're progressing in class? It's a basic human need that's not being fulfilled and there's so much shame around it because you feel like, why isn't it being fulfilled? There was a line in your book where you said, like a, one of your friends came over to your house, opened the fridge and asked if you were moving because there was nothing in there. Yeah. How, how did you find food? How did you find your basic needs so you could continue uh, on your day? You find it. You know, what I started to remember because it's memory, right? When you go back and it hits you. Um, it's different almost than nostalgia. Huh. But so the memory is people who gave you money on the street. Hmm. I would go up to people and say, do you have a quarter? Hmm. Do you have 50 cents? It's going to soup kitchens, Catholic churches, 
friendships where you know parents are going to make three meals a day. So you form those uh, friendships. You go over to the house and you wait for the meal. Wow. I mean, there was there was this other part of the book. I think it's a chapter you entitled Running. And you were literally, as you call it, hunted down by young boys chasing you, calling you the N word. You were Mm -hmm. like, in a sense, running for your life. Yeah. In those moments, I can't imagine that was happening day after day, that kind of horrific bullying. It it was day after day. That's what it felt like. Mm -hmm. Now, was I actually running from my life? Would they actually have killed me? I don't know about that, but that's what it felt like. It's Mm -hmm. just like anxiety. They say anxiety is just fear of death. What I realized from a very early age was I was born in a world that I just didn't fit into. And I did not have the language to understand uh, the power of race, Mm -hmm. the power of being dark skin, the the potency Mm -hmm. of being different. The power of that is just not how I was defined by those eight or nine boys. It's how the world defined me. (sighs) It's that fear of being black, what black meant in that, in this powerful caste system we have of how you treat people based on perceived value Mm -hmm. and worth. And I was worthless. Hmm. That's what it told me. I was a child. Children cannot deal with the abstract, Mm -hmm. right? We don't have those building blocks. And so it felt like I was running for my life and it, I didn't have any arms to run into. So I was just running. And when you say no arms to run into, you describe, it's so poetic and sad. It like struck me over and Mm. over in my heart. But you even talked about how there weren't enough pages in the book to chronicle all of the fights that went on inside your home, what you were, what you bore witness to, what you felt helpless. I, I would imagine as a kid watching this in front of you. You do. It's, it's, it's the last of the acceptable violences is domestic violence. Nobody really cares. I, I'll tell you that. I, I think it's a complicated issue to deal with. And um, so what happens is you sort of sweep it under the rug. It becomes your sort of dirty secret. Yeah. But every time you faced it, it is absolutely traumatic. If I felt like I was running for my life from the eight or nine boys, I felt then I had to go into a home where I was running from my life. Hmm. That's what it felt like when I would witness the violence between my mom and dad. And I, 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 I keep remembering these moments of violence that even happened at night in the middle of the street and not one window opened. No one came out to help. And I, 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 and I look back on that now because as a kid, we prayed that no one would see us. <laughs> and then as an adult, I'm looking back and go, why didn't anybody see us or help us? Or did they see us? It becomes that complicated. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. were defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this?
the day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. What was your survival technique, like to live day in and day out in a home that felt like that and to go to school in a situation that felt like that? You had to have some place where you, little Viola, went to to live. How did you transport yourself? Well, little Viola, I had a whole technique of leaving my body. It was pretty awesome, by the way. Tell me. Um... I'd always go into the bathroom and I would stay there for the longest time. And I had a whole thing where I just would focus on one part of my body, usually my finger, and I'd shut everything down. Huh. And after a certain amount of time, I literally would leave my body and I'd go up to the ceiling, huh. I'd turn around and I would look at myself. I dreamed. Huh. I tried to achieve, and I kept secrets. You kept secrets. I felt like the keeping of the secret, the people not knowing it, sort of helped me to survive. I didn't understand anything um, uh, about secrets actually eroding you. Mm -hmm. That wasn't a part of my vocabulary, my understanding of human emotion. I just felt like if, if no one knew, then how they would see me is based on what I was achieving outside of my house. Uh -huh. I recreated myself. Wow. <laughs> wow. But when you recreate yourself and mm -hmm. another reality from yourself, the danger of that is you also disconnect. Yeah. And that's what I did. I disconnected. Same thing that I did when I sat on the toilet. And the disconnection, or like a lot of um, people who go through trauma, mm -hmm. when they compartmentalize, yep. which is also not good. Yeah. That's what I did. I compartmentalize. I use drive and ambition to replace feeling and vulnerability. Did you ever feel like your stuff was unhealable, like that was just going to be you? Well, I wish I could uh, store it away, mm -hmm. but I had to unpack it. Yeah. Here's what I believe. I believe that what connects us is not just the joy, is not just the achievements, it's also the sadness. Yeah. It's also the pain. Yeah. I feel that if I cannot share my pain with someone mm -hmm. else, the pain, the joy, the mm -hmm. achievements, then it's not real connection. But in order for me to share that, for me to have the ability to share that, I have to unpack it. One of the first quotes <clears throat> in your book is about faith. It says, I think human beings must have faith or must look for faith. Otherwise, our life is is empty. I feel like that constantly saved you. Yeah. Well, absolutely, which is yeah. the belief in things that you cannot see. Yeah. Because there's nothing else. Mm -hmm. I think that I, I was, I didn't have anything else. But I always compare, you know, my life to that image of the first man on earth looking out at the ocean and the mountains and the sky and maybe it's raining and there's thunder and lightning and he has no language because this is before language. Yeah. This is before psychology. Yeah. This is before people were named. This is before love or hate yeah. or anything. Yeah. And how then do you figure out life? How then do you figure out meaning? What, how do you communicate in or, anything in order to find it? That's how I felt. I have nothing. I have and chills. so chills right now on me. So what you, what you then rely yeah. on, see, this is the power of connection. Yes. What you rely on are people who see you. People 
who really maybe see the pain, see the potential, see the talent, people who just love you. Oh. And they carry you. You know, there was a moment, obviously, that changed your life. And it was when you flipped on the TV and the autobiography of Miss Jane Pittman came on and Miss Cicely oh. Tyson was starring in it. Uh. What did, you, what did young Viola's eyes see in that moment? Magic. Mm. I saw everything. I saw what I wanted to be. Mm. I um, saw my possibilities. I saw my value. I saw it all in her. And I was like, that's it. You know, it was a path, a blazing path for me. And listen, like I said, my sister Dolores is an incredible teacher right now. My sister Diane works for the Department of Agriculture in D.C. And um, my sister Anita went to business school, whatever. And for all of us, it changed us. Not even just in the acting field. It lit um, fire inside huh. of us that wasn't in our lives before. Because your sister Dolores, I think it was Dolores, who told you we're not going to live like this. What I mean, to think that all of these sisters were raised in these really horrific circumstances, yet somehow you grew, all of you. It wasn't like you weren't the one that got out. What was it that was in the family that made that possible for all of the sisters to get out? Well, first of all, you have to define getting out mm -hmm. because I know me, I do have some level of trauma and anxiety from the past. Sure. So getting out in terms of my profession. Yeah. Um, required drive. Yes. Drive is different than growth and healing. Now the getting out emotionally getting out is totally different, huh. which is why I wrote the book. You don't get out. That's what happens. You have to reconcile um, and own your story. Hmm. I didn't. I cut it out like it was the fat on an awesome piece of filet mignon. You cut out the fat and you recreate the story that you want to create. Hmm. The problem with that is that once again, you make yourself tough. You shut out the dark. You also shut out the light. Huh. And so that's what I realized when I was 28 is that I didn't get out. Huh. Hoda. Huh. I didn't. But I, 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 I didn't know how to sort of reconcile it. How did you, or did you? Ownership. Hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what I did. Yeah. You either own your story or your story owns you. I'm not ashamed of it because I know that every single part of it made me who I am. I'm owning my story so people can be less alone. And I'm also owning my story because I want to love me. Hold up. <laughs> I mean, at some point, I mean, you know, come on. It's like, you know, I'm 56. <laughs> you know, I, I was listening to Alicia Keys' song, I Have a Voice. It's so mm -hmm. powerful. It's with Brandi Carlisle. And every time I hear it, I think to myself, I'm 57, and I think to myself often, like, when did, what took me so long to have it? You know, like, you do all these things in life. And you nod your head. And I had that same epiphany. It's like, am I going to be going to my grave with good enough? That's yeah. all I deserve. When did you, when was it that you knew your worth? When did you know your worth? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm trying, the only reason why I'm silent is not because I don't have an answer, it's because I'm deciding if I want to say it or not, because I'm, and I should just say it. It's a work in progress. Yeah. 
I started the journey in understanding the value of worth when I was 28 years old. Because as much as I said, I don't want to be my mom. I love, love my mom, but I want to be my mom. I realized I was my mom. She was my imprinter, you know. And I would say by the time I met my husband at 34, 35, I knew that I was worth more than what I was accepting in my life before Mm -hmm. that time. I always define my life as, um, or life in general, as a relay race. So your purpose in life is just like a relay race. Great runners. Yeah. And each runner runs their leg of the race and they pass a baton on to the next great runner and they run their leg of the race and that's how life goes. But man, I just, as I'm getting older, I'm realizing life is about connection, but it's about you. Everything comes from you. So each of those great runners is just you at a different age. (laughs) It's young Viola surviving that path, but getting that baton to 28 year old Viola who says, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take it Viola. I'm going to go to Juilliard. I'm going to do this or whatever. I'm going to work in the theater. I'm going to do the best I can or whatever. And then hits a wall and goes, oh my God. I'm going to give it to the 38, 39 year old Viola who's getting married and understands that now I got to now take another entity into consideration. And now I'm at 56 year old Viola. And one of the reasons why I wrote the book one, once again mm-hmm. is because I felt that 54, I was dropping the baton. <laughs> Cause I was looking back too much, but life, That's how I see it. It's a whole relay race of you. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Hallie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the press now. Streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now, with your upbringing, and you you have Genesis, your beautiful yeah. daughter, were you, as after you got married, yes, I definitely want kids. No, I definitely don't want kids. I'm not sure what I want to do about kids, given what you had seen. Definitely felt like I didn't want to get married or have children. I I didn't see being alone as not sexy. I thought it was sort of sexy. I would see like Linda Evans Uh at awards shows. And um, I thought that was pretty cool that Uh she went by herself. I thought that's a strong woman. I still feel that way, by the way. Uh I hit it. (laughs) Okay. Let's just say that. I hit it. You would say that I've achieved a certain level of success. 
And then I crashed and burned because I was like, this is it? <laughs> Why is this it? Because I stopped at success and not at significance. Mm. And I remember running into Lorraine Toussaint and I remember asking her, Lorraine, why did you adopt your daughter? Mm. And she paused for the longest time and she said, I didn't want series regular to be on my tombstone. <laughs> wow. Wow. And it hit me that my entire life has been defined by achievement taking the place of meaning. Mm. Oh, man. I'm so conscious, even with Genesis, that I always want to say, you know, you're not an extension of mommy's dreams. Mm -hmm. She's her own person. But at the same time, I do sort of believe that she's, she's my legacy. She's wow. my hope. Yeah. Wow. She's my meaning. I just rewatched your Oscar acceptance speech. Mm -hmm. And at the end, you talked about your parents. And you talked about how grateful to God you were that those were the people who were chosen to give birth to you. And after reading your book, I found that so profound, knowing what yeah. you had been through. Why did you say that? Here's what I know about my life. What I learned from a very young age is radical love, radical forgiveness, huh. radical transformation. Mm -hmm. What I was giving with my parents is an opportunity <laughs> to grow. Oof. They gave me that ingredient that could either have killed me or had me grow in a way that some people never experience in their entire lives. Wow. And that's why when I finally ended the book, I ended the book with God kept me exactly where I was yes. at. Yes. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos. The learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. One of my favorite paragraphs in the whole book, and there are so many good ones, is this one. Uh -huh. The question still echoes, how did I claw my way out? There is no out. Every painful memory, every mentor, every friend and foe served as a chisel, a leap pad that has shaped me. The imperfect but blessed sculpture that is Viola is still growing and still being chiseled. My elixir, I'm no longer ashamed of me. I own everything that has ever happened to me. The parts that were the source of shame are actually my, my warrior fuel. Come on! Come on, that's awesome! That is so awesome! I underlined it. I'm highlighting it when I get the real book. I'm going to keep it by my bed. It is so incredibly beautiful. Um, and again, just lastly, as we wrap up, the title is Finding Me. Have you... Have you found her? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have. You know, I, told, I, I, I said it, you know, little Viola is celebrating. She's sitting right next to me, and mm -hmm. she's happy that she's finally being embraced. Yeah. Well, 
Viola, it's a beautiful, beautiful book. I've been waiting for this book and people are going to devour this. I think you're going to change. I mean, you've already changed a million people's lives, but I have a feeling you're going to do a lot more with this. Thank, Thank you, so Viola. Much. I adore Thank you. you. Thank you so I much. You I'm keeping too, this. I love okay. You. <laughs> I love you. See ya. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Ready to pull the stem out? Watch. You go like this. Just bend it. <laughs> That's a funny sound, huh? Peace. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Dylan Dishes Cooking with Cal on Today All Day. This week it's Taco Tuesday, and we are showing you our favorite ways to turn any Tuesday into a fiesta with my steak tacos and turkey veggie quesadillas. And of course, any taco night wouldn't be complete without a great salsa. So don't miss a bonus recipe, my zesty mango salad, which can be made mild or spicy, however you like it. All right, so planning meals for an entire week can be so challenging, so stressful. One way to make meal prep easier is to give each night its own theme. I find that when you have a theme, it's easy to program your favorite dishes to kind of match that menu. So our first recipe is for steak tacos. For this steak marinade, you're gonna need garlic, cilantro, jalapeno, orange, lime, vinegar, oil, and salt. And for the homemade salsa to top these tacos with, you'll need tomatoes, onions, garlic, cilantro, jalapeno, olive oil, lime, and salt. So I've got this split up into our different ingredients. This is all going to be for the marinade, and this is all for our pico de gallo and our toppings and everything once we actually make the tacos. So, here we go. Let's get started. So what we're going to do first is make a marinade for our skirt steak. We want it to marinate for about two to eight hours. Any longer than that, the steak's gonna to turn to mush. Oh, I got my hug, I love my hugs. There's a fancy way you can make this with a mortar and pestle. I just like to throw it all in the food processor. It's not as fancy, but it gets the job done. Can I do a little off? Sure. Oh. Can I show you a trick? Mm -hmm. I did a great job. Right. Throw all that in there. These are awesome garlics. Say Chanel, this is jalapeno business. Say Chanel, this is jalapeno business. Cool. That's Chanel's favorite joke. Let's throw in some cilantro. Mmm. Mmm. Throw this in there. Ooh, yummy, yummy, yummy. Can I? I can't taste it. You want to taste it? Yeah. I'm tasting the juice. You can have that one. I'll, I'll do the juices. Then I'm going to, can I blend it? Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm going to blend it. Vinegar? Mm -hmm. Smell that. I think I only have like two tablespoons left. Olive oil, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six. Yeah. Press it again. All right, so we have our marinade and we are going to pour it all over the steak and then just let it sit for the next several hours. Ooh. Let's cover this up and we'll pop it in the fridge and then we can make our salsa. Just need a couple of big chops because we're going to let the food processor do all the work. Do onions make you cry? Yeah. Oh man. Did you remember your trick? pink color but that's because of the food processor. Okay. You gonna clean this mess for me? It does a, a bit one. <laughs> We're gonna let this sit and all the flavors come together. We've got the steak marinating and all those flavors are gonna come together and later we'll fire up the grill pan and we'll make our steak tacos, right? Okay. Okay, so we have had the steak marinating all day long, right? It's a little bit closer to dinner time now, right? Are you hungry? It's already dinner time. 
So we should finish this. Yeah, we have to hurry. Okay. <laughs> I love that sound. <laughs> Can I have pepper? Okay, that's why I, I wanted to do it. <laughs> Is that the pepper? Should we make some guacamole? Guacamole! So you'll notice if you look at the meat, it all goes that way, like all the lines are kind of going that way. So we want to cut this way against the grain so that it's nice and tender. Otherwise, it'll be too hard to chew. All right, should we try it? Um, how I, I can't do it, honestly. How do you think? Yummy. Do you um, like tacos? I want another one. The next recipe on our menu for Taco Tuesday is a veggie and turkey quesadilla. The secret to this recipe is to really just use whatever you have around the house. Just open the fridge, pull out whatever veggies or meat you have on hand. And here's how Cal and I made our easy cheesy quesadillas. Do you love quesadillas? Mm -hmm. Yum, yum, yum. Ready to get started? Mm -hmm. Okay. Why do you like quesadillas? Because they, you can have cheese in them. Is it just a means of eating cheese? Um, yeah. <laughs> you did pretty good, that's perfect. Okay, let's cut up some zucchini and we'll try it again. Cut it, I'll give you some strips to cut, okay? Yeah, what's your favorite food? Fried rice. Fried rice. Maybe we'll make fried rice one day. What do you think? While you do that, I'm going to peel the carrot, okay? okay. Who picks mushrooms? Farmers. Oh, for us? Mm-hmm. So you like mushrooms? Ah, uh, of course I do. Ready to pull the stem out? Watch, you go like this. Just bend it over. That's a funny sound, huh? Nice. Slice them up nice and thin like this. Guess what time it is? Huh? It's onion time. So I'm gonna do this onion real quick, okay? See you later. Oh, that's a gross onion. What? What's in that gross onion? Look at that. All right, no onion. Is that a little salt and pepper? It's turkey. Oh. We're gonna use this instead of beef tonight because we had beef last Did night. Did someone catch a turkey? I think they caught the turkey, yeah. What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us 
on the status of negotiations. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Hey, Ollie, what's for dinner? Later. Tacos? Can you say taco? Taco. <laughs> Ollie, can you say taco? Taco. <laughs> and cheese? cheese? Ollie, Ollie, can you say cheese? Cheese. <laughs> Ollie, can you say beef? Beef. <laughs> Welcome back to Dylan Dishes, Cooking with Cal. So you just heard Ollie say it. It's Taco Tuesday. And this week we're showing you our favorite ways to turn any night into a fiesta. Now, of course, this theme night wouldn't be complete without chips and salsa. And sometimes I like to mix it up with something sweet. So I recently taught Calvin how to make my mango salad that doubles as a salsa. I love this recipe because it's really versatile. And for this recipe, you're going to need mango, shallots, red bell pepper, cilantro, and lime juice. Sour. Not sour. Sour. Juicy. <laughs> Juicy and sweet. You were just teasing. All right, that's enough mango, right? Mm -hmm. So can you help me put all the mango in the bowl? This is all my pile. That's your this, pile? And this is your tiny bit pile. I can do this bit pile? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it slipped out my hands. <laughs> do you know what this is? No. Onion. It does look like an onion. This is actually called a shallot. Wait, it's gonna hurt my eyes. Okay. It's gonna hurt my eyes? It's not gonna hurt your eyes, okay? What is this? Um, tomato. Pepper. A squeeze it. A pepper? Why do you want to keep squeezing? This is for the lime, silly goose. This, that's a big strip. All right, let's put the red pepper in. What color is missing in here? Green. Green. Cilantro. Cilantro. <laughs> you can help me pick off some of these leaves, okay? I love them. my own. He loves me? He loves me not. He loves me? He loves me not. Have you ever heard of that before? No. Yeah, I don't think so. Have you ever tasted want... cilantro? No. Nice pop of color. <gasps> pop. I'm sure I'm strong, man. So you could try to squeeze it first on your own. <laughs> Squeeze and twist. Squeeze and twist. I do the other line, okay, Mom? I don't know if you need the other line. Let's add a little salt and pepper. That's salt! Because the salt brings out the sweetness. And we'll do a little pepper. Brings out the spiciness? <laughs> okay. 
For all these recipes, go to today.com slash Dylan Dishes. I dropped the noodles, my bad. Five second rule, but just to be safe, I'm gonna put them in the dishwasher. But I mean, other times, if I wasn't on national television, I'd still go by the five second rule. I'm Matthew Smith, and this is Kids in the Kitchen. When I really started cooking was when I was seven years old. That's when I really got into the love of cooking. My family's Vietnamese heritage definitely influences my um, cooking style. My Bao Wai uses some specific ingredients that I still use to this day. I've kind of looked into those ingredients from starting to see things on the internet and starting to kind of be like, oh, lemongrass, for example, is actually used in Vietnamese cooking. And then from there, digging a little deeper, I actually learned, oh, that was the ingredient that my grandma might have had used in one of her recipes. I didn't really have an exact game plan, but I just like kind of loved the experience. I think that the best thing that I learned from participating on the show was not something that I realized immediately, it's actually something that I've come to realize over the years, is that food has so many memories behind it because when I think about it, I don't remember every single dish I made. I don't remember if I finished it in the correct time period. I don't even remember if the judges liked it or not. What I remember are those 23 other kids on the show who were just such a blast and the memories and going out to eat with them and living the life in LA. That's what I remember the most. At the start of this pandemic, um, I had a lot of time off from remote learning, so I decided to cook for 100 days straight. You know, first it was Italy, then it was Asia, then it was a good dessert route. But my dad did remember it as 100 days of cleaning. I'm still 11 years old, so some of my favorite hobbies, I think, are definitely playing the piano. I love playing downstairs ninja, gotta like boom, 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 boom. I think my favorite equipment is probably just the rings because you could just kind of climb on them. And I love reading, you know? So my advice for adults who are not great cooks is try to just see the other joys of it because cooking isn't just about making the food. So just find a part of that that you like to enjoy the process as you go along with it. Welcome to my kitchen. Today, I'm going to be making my Baowai inspired crispy chicken ramen bowl with soy sauce eggs. I love this dish because it reminds me of Baowai because of all the Vietnamese flavors. I'm here at my ramen noodle station. I'm gonna be needing 120 grams of bread flour. I'm also gonna need um, 60 milliliters of warm water, and this is so we can uh, dissolve um, our teaspoon of baked baking soda. And finally, we're just gonna need a pinch of salt to give a depth of flavor. I'm gonna dissolve my teaspoon of baked baking soda. So now, in order to get this all incorporated into our bread flour, um, I'm just gonna kind of make a small well here, similar to how I would do for uh, pasta. I'm just gonna add in my water mixture. For our depth of flavor, just kind of making our taste buds think a little more, we're gonna be adding in um, our pinch of salt. As you can really see here, our dough is really starting to form. And now I feel like this is all kids' favorite part about cooking, but I'm gonna ditch the fork and I'm gonna get in there with my hands, just kind of starting to add some over since it's very gluey still. We're just kind of starting to add flour and then Majestically, we're gonna really get a dough out of here. And for kneading, there's really two different ways. I kind of like to use the ball of my hand and start kind of like kneading it this way, but you can also put it back upon itself, which creates more layers and spreads the moisture throughout. I'm gonna take my rolling pin and we're now gonna start rolling this out into a little square to spread more of that more uh, moisture and all. We're gonna cover it with the saran wrap and rest it for about an hour. If you want to do it overnight, you can just refrigerate it and take it out in the morning. So now we're gonna be getting started at our chicken station to make our crispy chicken. 
the star of the show. But um, for this, you're just gonna need two um, skin, um, skin on chicken thighs, as well as some coarse kosher sea salt and some grapeseed oil. So now it's time to score our chicken. Um, this is just by kind of making small cuts within the skin and not the actual poultry. This is gonna ensure that we get a really nice crispy chicken breast. And it will, and will also make sure it crackles up. Now using my other hand, I'm just gonna salt it, making sure to get into all of those uh, cracks as well. I have some grapeseed oil, which is perfect for cooking at high temperatures. So I'm now just gonna add in our chicken breasts that we made, uh, chicken thighs, my bad. And we're gonna put them skin down and let them cook for about seven to 10 minutes. And you wanna cook it to an internal temperature of 165 degrees. It says that it is an internal temperature of 100 and 66, so I think we did our job, everybody. So now I'm just gonna put this out onto a plate. We're gonna let that rest over there. So we don't wanna get rid of all of that goodness on the bottom of the pot just yet, because that's gonna be the base for our broth. I will definitely say while making this, there's a lot of influence from my uh, Bawai's cooking this dish more, such as the ginger. It was something she used very often. It's so small when it's roasted. It just gives that magical and kind of like pop acidic flavor in the back of your throat. So kind of working all throughout the mouth. So now to this pot of chicken goodness, I have uh, my shiitake mushrooms, about a fourth to a half a cup. And to that, I'm gonna add in my sliced ginger. To release that ginger flavor, I really find that by cooking it over low heat um, and by slicing it, it really releases the flavor even more. And now we're gonna add in the minced ginger since it's we just want it to disintegrate, but we don't want it to burn. You know when this is ready, and I find it's just because you can really smell that ginger coming alive and stuff. So, that's how I know this is all ready and the mushrooms are a little wilted. I'm gonna add in my chicken stock. So now I'm gonna add in um, my small star anise. I feel like this um, leaves a hint of almost like a pho flavor, which has this very odd um, kind of smell to it, almost majestical if you were to have like a magic castle. But I'm also gonna add in some dried lemongrass. It doesn't have the acidity of fresh lemongrass, but it does give a really nice lemon flavor. So now we're gonna bring this mixture up to a boil and then we're gonna simmer it for 10 minutes to really let the flavors meld together before adding on almost another layer of seasonings. What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Hamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by.
Now Tonight with Joshua Johnson. Streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now? What it all means for you for an hour every day? It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. In order to accomplish these uh, soy sauce eggs, you're gonna need some eggs, sesame oil, some marin, as well as um, a good amount of soy sauce. The first thing you want to do is bring your salted water to a boil. We're gonna immediately add our eggs, and then you're gonna cook this for six and a half minutes. So now that my eggs are done cooking, I'm gonna put them in an ice bath. I'm going to get started making the marinade. I'm going to add in my two tablespoons of soy sauce. And then again, for that little bit of uh, stickiness slash sweetness, we're going to add in our marin, about, two, uh, about a tablespoon or so, and then a bowl turn or a tablespoon of toasted sesame oil. It's time to peel our, our soft boiled eggs. Now we're going to let our little babies rest. So now we are at our noodle station and we're here to continue preparing our dough. So um, I'm gonna get started rolling it by hand. Um, this is a lot more fun, um, but can also get a little messy too. And I'm just gonna put that on a well floured surface using some bread flour as well. We're gonna go once, go twice, and then we're gonna start making cuts throughout. One, and then we're gonna take it apart and you got a noodle. For the thickness, there's not like an exact thickness, but not as big as you would cut fettuccine, which is a little wider, but not as small as spaghetti. It, a lot of it's also trial and error, if I'm honest with you, but that's my favorite part about being a home cook. We're gonna cook these for four to five minutes so we get those tender springy noodles or otherwise known as al dante. Now that our noodles are cooking, we are getting started um, to finish our broth. So now we're gonna add in that second layer of flavor. So to kind of help that lemongrass out a bit, we have two teaspoons of lemon juice, a little bit of soy sauce. I'm gonna add in some marin, a Japanese wine. Um, also some rice wine vinegar, and then a pinch of salt for again that depth of flavor. Some black pepper for a little bit of bitterness. That's all ready, and let's go check on our noodles. Those are nice and tender, so I'm just gonna scoop some out into a bowl. It's time to go head over to our broth station. So now we're gonna bring our noodles over and we're gonna add some of our delicious broth. This reminds me of my bao wai or my grandma's pho. Like I said earlier, although I love just when I'm with the food, I also love when I'm with my bao wai or my grandma. Hello bao wai. I'm so excited to garnish one of my favorite dishes, but also be with my favorite person. Um, but I, I just want to kind of cut it around the bone. Um, and so I'm going to probably cut it into three pieces. We got our scallions now, Bawai. I'm now also going to add in my soy sauce eggs. And now we're just going to cut it, Bawai, too. And wow, look at that runny egg yolk, Bawai. Isn't that just so satisfying? Now, Bawai, um, we're gonna get started placing our chicken. And I'll add in both of my eggs, topping it with some black sesame seeds for a little pop. We're just gonna garnish with these um, spring onions. All right, Bawai, here's the final product. And here it is. How do you think it looks, Bawai? Good? Nice. Mm, so good. But why? Do you like this dish? Yes, I love it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. But 
thank you. Well, I mean, thank you for teaching, like just kind of being the inspiration to discovering my Asian heritage and making me so proud of that. So now we're gonna continue digging in. I hope you guys enjoyed this recipe as much as I did and thank you again for joining me. At just 29 years old, Justin Thomas is one of golf's most recognizable stars. And one of the best players in the world. A 15-time winner on the PGA Tour, his resume boasts two major titles, the PGA Championship last month and also winning it for the first time in 2017. So JT, give me some of your earliest memories of learning about the game of golf from your dad. Oh man, uh, I've had a lot of a lot of memories. Oh, Daddy. oh, good shot. Our best and probably fondest memory. I'm just hitting balls and practicing all day, waiting for dad to get done with work so we can go play nine holes. Justin's dad, Mike Thomas, worked 90 hour weeks as a teaching pro at Harmony Landing in Goshen, Kentucky. He is the only coach Justin's ever had. I had read that you got serious about golf at some point. Mm -hmm. You were like, I want to get a coach. Your dad was like, well, I am your coach. <laughs> yeah. And you said, no, a real one. <laughs> yeah, that is that is a true story. We have some laughs on that because, you know, I didn't know any better. The biggest memories I have from when he was young was all the chipping contests mm -hmm. we used to have up at the putting green. They were pretty fierce battles, uh, a lot of competitiveness going on. He continued to do really special things at every level he was playing at, whether he was eight years old and 10. 12 and so forth. The heart that he had and the stomach that he had was really something that you couldn't teach. Thank you! You know, my relationship with my stepdad was born and raised on the golf course. I lost my dad when I was five years old. And everything about life that I've learned, everything that I am as a man now is with my dad on the golf course. What sort of life lessons did you learn on the golf course? There's a reason why there's nothing like going out and playing golf with your dad. When we get on the 18th green, you know, shake hands, hug, say thanks. That was a lot of fun. Those memories, but just being able to enjoy it. Um, I think that was always something my dad hammered down my throat is just to enjoy what you're doing. And how has your relationship evolved even now? Before Southern Hills, you were frustrated and it wasn't going well. You were just out there kind of grinding. I'll sometimes get on my dad like, we need to do this. Or like, why, why aren't you saying this? Or why aren't you saying that? He's like, I could tell, you know, it's kind of like, you need to calm down kind of thing. Like just play golf, not golf swing. But if we're not kind of having those maybe butting heads moment, like we're, holding each other accountable, and right. that's how we've gotten to where we are. Golf runs deep in the Thomas family. Mike is a former PGA pro, and his father, Paul, who passed away last year, played professionally as well. Justin says he misses his grandfather, even his no filter. When you're 85, there's no filter. It's like, boy, you really just couldn't make anything today. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm aware, Grandpa. Thanks for telling me. <laughs> I love that video of when he called you during the press conference. Hey, Grandpa, can I call you back? I'm in the middle of a press conference. <laughs> I, I still keep all his voicemails from, and, and I'll listen to him from time to time. I mean, nothing would cheer me up like uh, like hearing from him. The no filter, real, yeah. real talk is sometimes what you need to hear. I wondered if it really resonated with you, how lucky you are that your dad's gotten to see you win so much and you got to share all of that with him. Yeah, definitely the first, the PGA at Quail Hollow when I see that, you know, that video and my dad just kind of goes like this. Like it's, it's one of the few things that gives me, you know, a knot in my throat. It was such a cool moment for us. Yeah, that's special. What are you most proud of him as a man off the golf course? For sure, more, more proud of him as a person than as a golfer. We always tried to give the message to him that people are going to remember how you treated them more so than what your accomplishments were in a sport. I'm more proud of his willingness to give and be good to other people than I am of his accomplishments in golf. There's a lot to be proud of. He started the Justin Thomas Foundation to help children in need fulfill their potential. He's also an ambassador for the sport, hosting the Justin Thomas Junior Championship. It is a very unique, totally, totally different than any kind of winning golf tournament feeling, but it's it's an unbelievable feeling. Justin once famously gave his dad a sand wedge that he still walks around with. I've heard about it, but I had to ask the story behind it. How it started is it's just my dad, he always needs something to hold and kind of lean on. I go to my bag to get my 60 to chip and I'm like, dad, I'm like, get, like just choose a different club. I honestly got so fed up with that. I'm like, I'm just gonna start carrying another wedge that is strictly for you to walk and use. Right. Now, it's also a special keepsake. 
Justin gets the club stamped, marking fun moments with his dad at every tournament. We go to this barbecue restaurant. He stamped it Meat Coma, and the date of the tournament's on there. Every tournament since then is stamped on there. I was having my own father-son moment, too. <laughs> my son, Jackson, was there interviewing Justin for his assignment with NBC Nightly News Kids Edition. I know your dad's your coach. What was it like? Because my dad's my coach, and sometimes... He can get me a little mad, kind of yeah. always like giving me It doesn't me change, by the way. It, it doesn't? Does, okay. Yeah, I'm 29, and yeah. it still happens from time to time. And this has been really special. I want to thank you guys on a, on a Father's Day weekend. I'm thinking about my dad, and you've met my son who's here, Jackson, yeah. who spoke to you a little bit for our, his Nightly News Kids thing as yeah. well. So this is a real special mm -hmm. weekend for us. A happy Father's Day. Yeah, yeah thank you. Guys. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Oh, they're really such a great family. Yeah. I, I loved doing that. As you can imagine, we were in Justin's house in Jupiter, and the, the Today Show setup is there, the whole crew. And yeah. so I'm like, well, I should go first. And there's a chair for Justin, you yeah. know, the interview chair. Yeah. And Jackson's going to interview him for night. He says, let me go first. Let the kids see how, how it's done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Put him at ease. Yeah. And they're like, Jackson, you're going to go first. Jackson sits there with Justin, crushes it. I'm in the other room, like, <laughs> biting my nails. Like, How's it going? How's it going? And all I hear is Jackson laughing and JT's laughing. Oh. I'm like, undoubtedly, this interview is going to uh -oh. be better than whatever I do. Wow. You know when you like pinch yourself and it yeah. happens weekly or yeah. daily but yesterday yesterday was crazy his energy Breland is this is this young talented incredible he's singer. an amazing singer he, this is a moment this was in a commercial break Breland was singing a song okay he was look rehearsing that. that's Brian Cranston look at wow. Jenna and I are losing it <laughs> it was beautiful praise music it was wild he is in a moment in his life. Look and at that. that right there. He kept saying, I never expected Brian Cranston to be dancing with me in a commercial break while I was rehearsing. This was this was a moment for yes. him. I feel like his life is all like converging into this one yes. moment. And we uh, we'll be honest, we didn't know his name until no. yesterday. No. And we're like, who is this phenom? Who's this talent? You remember when Lizzo was first yes. on our show yeah. and and she was just kind of on the precipice yeah, yeah, of being yeah. huge. Yeah. We were like, "Oh my who gosh, she's saying she? that ballad." Yeah. That's how it felt, and it was a moment for him, but what even more? It was a moment for everybody in the room. Yeah. Because when somebody is doing yeah. what they're meant to do, mm -hmm. you can feel it. Yeah. It was you could feel it. We walked out, and there was a moment where he and his mom and dad were there, and they were watching this moment where he got some national TV exposure, and they had a oh. prayer moment right there, which was something that was so uh, kind of took our breath away. And so when they got to watch their son perform, which was an incredible moment, um, it was as if they knew that he was do doing the right thing in his life. Yeah. It wasn't that they were like, of Surprised. course we knew he could do it. Yeah. It wasn't that. Yeah. There was a quiet kind of confidence, like, yes, well, that's why he's here. Yes. That's what he's meant to be yes. doing. And his music, Breland, please look it up. And by the way, I went to lunch yesterday with Mary, the, my friend who they surprised us yes. with on oh, the show oh, from good. College of so glad. Who sat next to us? Breland no. and his mom and dad. And they were talking about the show. They, said they they couldn't believe it. I showed them all the pictures. I said, did you see this picture of Brian Cranston's dancing? And they asked me, so I gave, I, I gave them the pictures. But they were together, talked nonstop at the table next to me about what an awesome day it was oh, for them. I God, thought it, was it was so beautiful. awesome for us, too. Y'all, download his music. Also, how often is it that we hear somebody and then you immediately, I mean, first of all, you don't text people music. <laughs> Most people are like, here's a playlist I put together yeah. for you, honey. Yeah. I'm thinking yeah. of you. Yeah. Yeah. Hoda doesn't yeah. do that. No, I, she, yeah. don't, she don't waste the in-between. She goes straight. Full court press. Yeah. How many times have you played that a song? A thousand. I mean, I played it for all who? the way for in. For who? Well, Eddie, who drove yes. me in, yes. he was like, are we singing the truck song again? I go, yes, we are. <laughs> keep your hands off my truck. Who else have you played it for? Oh, I just keep, I keep saying have it. Have you played it for Savannah? <laughs> yeah. Yes, I played I'm this sure morning for her on the side. I was going, y'all listen. What about the whole 7 o'clock team? Yeah. Yes, everybody who was available listened. I can tell some people are like, here she goes. Did you play it for the so kids well. yet? <laughs> well, actually, they went to sleep. I'll, that's for today. They were by the time. that is their type of music. By the way, that so is. I can't but, wait to see Poppy and Haley dancing to Lizzo. 
We I cannot that wait. In my, no, we you know are Oprah? dying. You know how Oprah, like, yeah, he envisioned Oprah moment. coming here that was our this moment. summer? This is their moment. They're dancing they're to gonna, Lizzo. They're going to be, oh, they're going to die. I can't wait. I hope everybody's but, in town. But it, I kept thinking about some people don't, like, when you think about Breland, some people go their whole lives and don't know why they were here, why they were be it why they were on this earth. Yeah. I felt like he's always known, but there was a moment where I looked at it and I thought, you know, in your life you feel like sometimes you're swimming upstream and you're struggling and you're like, I know if I just work harder, I know, I know, I know. Yes. And then one day you do something else and you ride a wave. Yes. And you're like, this almost feels easy. Yes. So maybe this isn't it. It's actually it. Yes. Like that's it's like Talia working here. Yes. It's like she all was of a sudden to be you, here. You you are like, but can it be this much fun? Can it be that kind of place? You're riding a wave because it's meant to be. Like when you're on the path you're supposed to be on, Ugh. that's what happens. Why am I crying? Channing. Why am I crying? That's what Why am I crying? That's you know, what the happens. other thing I when you said that, it mm -hmm. made me also think of his parents. Yeah. And sometimes kids and I was one of these children mm -hmm. are sort of odd in the way they yeah. express themselves. Like yeah. I played Barbies till I was like 22. <laughs> and my parents at first were like, this is kind of strange. Yeah, how why is she doing She loves the stuff? dolls. And then my mom read an article that said that Toni Morrison played her doll, played dolls, played dolls, played dolls. And so instead of like squashing it, she thought, well, Jenna's just going to be a writer. Jenna's just going to love to read and write. That's okay. And I just keep thinking of like all of the parents that allow the weird, yeah. that allow yes. the strange, that allow the yes. space because yes. look what it turns yes. into. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Who is this? Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Teenage sisters on a mission to protect our oceans. They see changes happening firsthand because both are avid surfers. I got the chance to hear about their passions when I met them on their home turf. I mean surf, the beautiful <laughs> Hawaiian shoreline. We look at surfing like a a sport, but here, this is really ingrained in the culture, isn't it? Yeah, it's a cultural practice um, that has been practiced forever. Modern surfing's roots can be traced back more than 100 years to these waters. 18-year-old Anu De Soto and her 16-year-old sister Pua were born into that legacy. We started surfing around six months, just sitting on my dad's lap, you know? At going six on months a, old? Yeah, so we kind of grew up in the ocean. Their father, Dwayne, a surf legend on the island and beyond, not only passing along his passion for surfing to his eight kids, but also a respect for the ocean and values they take with them, whether on or off their boards. What have you learned about surfing that you can apply just to life in general? When you're surfing big waves, you're gonna get pounded and you're gonna come back up and you're gonna go back out and just get another wave, you know? And it kind of just teaches you to be resilient. Just having like the time to be in a place that's super powerful and just finding like the calm in the chaos sometimes is tricky in like real life. 
Another lesson they've learned on the water is how climate change is already having a big impact on their beloved beaches. So I watched the coral every day and I noticed that it was starting to bleach. And I went down this rabbit hole basically of what climate change is and what's happening to our environments. Um, and that led me into some environmental activism. Uh, you recently worked on a, ch a climate change policy. Tell me about that. In our eyes, we already know what's going to change the environment and what's going to help us fix climate change issues. And so we don't need more research. What we need to do is implement these answers and actually get them funded so that we can be doing the work that's actually going to make a change. The health of our oceans is critical in the fight against climate change and impact surfing. Waves are formed by the ocean floor and the shoreline. With waters warming, coral reefs dying, and beaches eroding, the sport and culture of surf are under threat. This whole beach is man-made. <laughs> and so as the sea level rises, this will definitely go back underwater. And the actual wave action itself will be affected. Yeah, it'll be totally different. There'll be new reefs, and it's just going to be much different and not what we're used to. What's the message about the health of of our oceans, not just here, but you know, around the world. The ocean is home to most <laughs> of the creatures living on this planet, and so we're destroying it. And as we destroy it, we're taking away these homes, and slowly the ecosystems will start to fail, and different pieces will fall out of the puzzle that creates this beautiful world. And we're going to lose food sources. We're going to lose, you know, being able to play and surf, which we obviously love a lot. <laughs> now they're on a mission to share their love for these waters and surfing with others, one wave at a time. For those of us who didn't grow up with surfing in their blood, how hard is it to start to learn how to surf? The hardest part is getting up on your feet, is to stand up on the board. A lot is going on, and you just have to continuously stay super present and just keep trying. I understand you guys are going to try to teach me how to do this? Yes. We're not going to try. We're going to teach. You're gonna, gonna I teach like you. that. No yeah. try. Do. You're going to get it. All right. OK, <laughs> let's do it. Close, so close, oh, so very I close. That was oh well. The winner. Ah, there you go. Surfing is a lot harder than it looks, and Pua hopes to compete in the surfing competition in the 2028 Games in Los Angeles. Anu runs and designs a bathing suit company that she started when she was just 12 years old, called Anu Hawaii. They're also educating local Hawaiian kids about water safety and conservation through their family's charity, Na Koma Kei. So head to today.com/climate, and you can learn more about climate change in our oceans. High five for trying. Well, I got to tell you, I mean, it is, was... you want to talk about a full body workout. Yeah. yeah. It is. I mean, and they're out there like four or five hours a day. Yeah. Don't Please. give up. You should keep taking lessons. No, I'm giving up. Yeah. <laughs> You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Allie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, who's this? To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, top story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by.
welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. Joy, companionship, and love. Oh, thank you so much. Quite like a dog, which is why Sue Bell created Homeward Trails in Fairfax Station, Virginia. Her mission, to find forever homes for as many of these adorable animals as possible. It's been 20 years since you founded Homeward Trails and you've rescued over 43,000 animals. Tell me about how it all began. I was vacationing in West Virginia. We drove by a building where there were a bunch of dogs tied up outside and we saw that it was the local animal control. So we stopped to donate some biscuits and we found out that their animal uh, shelter had been hit by a flash flood and they had lost 50 animals who had drowned. Determined to help, Sue took home three dogs that day with a mission to find them homes. From there, it snowballed. And then I became obsessed and turned it into a nonprofit organization uh, with the goal of rescuing 50 animals to pay it forward for the 50 animals who drowned. But I reached that number 50 a lot quicker than I thought. And once I did, I was hooked. Homeward Trails also provides the animals with much needed medical and behavioral care. How does it feel to be working with animals? Um, when it's good, it's good. Um, <laughs> there, are, there are days where we wish they could just talk to us. It's fantastic when you have that breakthrough. When you take a dog who has been abused or who has been neglected or shut down and see them literally start to trust, to start to appreciate the grass and the sunshine. It's transformative. Describe the feeling you feel when you see a dog go into their forever home. Just a really warm feeling, knowing that they're going to go on to be the center of that family's attention. So you fostered six dogs, mm -hmm. adopted two. Yes. Uh -huh. Those were Ray and Tyra. Yeah, they're total opposites. <laughs> Ray is a 70-pound black lab mix. Tyra is a feisty six-pound little pup. My partner Jake decided that since she stands on her back legs and has the short little arms, we should name her Tyra for Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> So, seeing those dogs have the shot at life and love that they deserve, those are the dogs that keep us all going. So this is your dog? Yep, this is Mia. Oh, She Hi, came to me just a couple years ago. What does Sue mean to the community? She's a force. She's one of those people that's you know, boots on the ground. She goes and does it herself. She doesn't just sit somewhere and direct. What do you hope is next for Homework Trails? If I'm going to be honest, I would love to go out of business. I would love that every animal has a home and that the shelters and the rescues could all shut down. You don't hear many founders say that they want to go out of business. I know. <laughs> I feel grateful all the time for Ray and Tyra. Ray was found as a stray. Tyra was dropped to be euthanized. And now here they are. These like full, beautiful lives that you would just have no idea. There's so many animals in shelters waiting for families who will see them as full, beautiful stories. For me, there's no better feeling, and that's what's kept me in this for, for 20 years. It never gets old. Given Sue's dedication to animals, we were excited to let her in on a little secret. Sue, we are surrounded by so many people who love you and appreciate all that you do here at this adoption center. Um, I actually wanted to fill you in on a little secret I have, but to do that, I need some help. Okay. Mia? Mia, come over here. Hi, Mia. <laughs> Our sponsor, Fresh Pet, heard about all of the amazing work that you do to help improve the lives of so many dogs that they want to present Homer Trails with a $20,000 donation. Oh my God. Our sponsor, Fresh Pet, also knows how many you have to feed when caring for all these dogs that they are also going to donate 1,000 meals over the course of a year. Oh my God. Isn't that sweet? Oh. 
Oh, Thanks. so sweet. So sweet. Thanks to our sponsor, Fresh Pet, we were able to pull off that awesome surprise. And guess what? Mm. We have another surprise. Oh, what? Homeward Trails decided to name an entire puppy litter after the Today Show family. Oh, my god. And Hoda, you're the mama. And then Wait, the rest what? are little babies. We're her pups? You're yeah, my you're pups? the pups. Savannah, oh. Al, Chanel, Craig, Carson, oh, Dylan, and Baby Which one do I look like? Yeah. Is that me? I think. Oh, you're there you are. Yeah, you're me. No. You're my mom. I'll take care of you forever, oh, baby. Take care, care, care of me. You're the mom, just like you're the mom here I'll to us, too. I love that. Um, Donna that's didn't sweet. make the cut, but you know. That's <laughs> <laughs> Maybe next year. Oh, my gosh. Okay, and if you want to adopt one of any of the puppies you've seen, we have more information on our oh, website, hoodandjenna.com. That was super sweet, Donna. There Maybe you. adopt Jenna. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were going to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos. The learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. So thrilled to be sitting across from you. I'm a longtime admirer of your work. How do you feel like you could observe the world through the eyes of these kids? I feel like that's part of my job is to show up with my whole self. And my whole self is joyful, hopeful, and brokenhearted. I put all of that in there because I remember what it was like as an eight-year-old. Children's book author Kate De Camillo's own childhood reads like the start of a grim fairy tale. For years, she endured chronic pneumonia. I would be home and sick, and so I learned to live in books. I learned to live in my imagination. With Kate's health in mind, her mother moved the family to Florida. Her father remained behind. My father leaving, that is the heartbreak that I think that I that's how I can connect to kids now because of that early loss. It puts a longing in place and that longing is what I tap into. Everybody's heartbroken in one way or another and we forget that. After college, Kate spent 10 years calling herself a writer without ever lifting a pen. I turned 30 and I thought, wow, I could like literally spend the rest of my life talking about this thing that I say that I want to do and not doing it. So I started to write. Do you want to guess how many rejection letters I got? Five. Five? Oh. Twelve. Over the next six years, Kate sent her work out into the world. The world didn't notice, but she persevered. Fifty? Fifty. I remember thinking, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. She tacked each rejection onto her wall, and there were plenty. 473. What? Yeah. No, it was that close. <laughs> Why would you keep them so you could see them? Did they motivate you? They did. People think, oh, okay, this is something I'm supposed to do. Therefore, it should be easy for me. And so you sit down in front of the blank page and it's really hard. And a lot of people just get up and don't come back to it, right? But you have to be patient with yourself and patient with the world. A little book called Because of When Dixie had been lost in a pile at the publishers when someone happened upon it. You could never have expected the success of that book. Oh, Jenna, no. I mean, for a middle grade novel from a first time author, 
If I was really, really lucky, I would sell 5,000 copies. I was in no way prepared for what happened. Kate's first book sold over 11 million copies. Come on, Winn-Dixie! Two decades and over 25 books later, many of which have been adapted for screen and stage, Kate's still in awe. Well, it makes me feel kind of dizzy to think about it. The wonder of it never goes away, and I can't get over it. And I think, never let me take this for granted. So 43 million books in print. Mm -hmm. You've won two Newberries, an opera based on one of your books. You have movies based on your books. But what gives you the most satisfaction? Those letters from kids. That's the most exciting thing to connect with the readers. And I say this to kids, it's like, we have this connection. If you never meet me, if we never talk, if you never write me a letter, you can still find me in a book and I can find you in a book and that's the, the miraculous thing about storytelling. That's why I feel like I know you. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen you in all those books. Yeah. All righty. Well, hey guys, thanks for being here. We really appreciate it. Uh, I the, the name of this show, Family Game Fight, uh, it... It sounds a little aggressive. It's not a good name. That's what I I'm said. I'm glad you pointed it there out. There are we, a lot of flaws in the show. Yeah, this yeah. is this is but one of many. But yes, uh, not <laughs> only that, but it it it's very hard to say. Your muscle memory wants to say family game night. So even Kristen, who I have to say, pound for pound is the most accurate, precise speaker on planet Earth. When she has to do recording for movies and match her lips to the to the screen. One take. Mm -hmm. I watch it all the time. She's a master. She fumbled family yeah. game fight. Because you want to say family game night. And that is the feeling of the show. Because it but it's two <laughs> families and because they don't know each other and you were building it up as a, a big it's a battle. It's a battle. We added the word fight. We're still mulling over whether that was the correct. We're decision. stuck with it. Yeah. Now just we painted ourselves into a corner and here we are. So so what's the premise? How what what constitutes the fight, the battle, what are they playing? How are they doing this? Lots of games, lots of weird games. There's a, there's a game called Pie Rollers where Dax and I each get a mystery word and we have to choose how many clues do we give you before you can guess the mystery word. And we basically bet. And then who, whichever family takes the bet, the losing family gets a pie to the face. That's a bad oh. game. Well, they, they get they get multiple pies multiple to the face. There's pies. nothing that's bad in the show that doesn't also then occur a million times. Yeah. So, and, and we, well, what makes this game show, I think much different is A, it originated from Kristen and I doing a, a bit on Ellen called um, Taste Buds, Taste Buds, where we're blindfolded and I'm tasting a banana. Oh, they're yellow. They grow on trees. Monkeys eat them. Eucalyptus. Eucalyptus. Is what I said. Al, no. Ah, I said. <laughs> no, 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 no. That's a koala. <laughs> so we played this game on Ellen and it was just an unmitigated disaster for about three and a half minutes. We, and yeah. we are not in on the joke, but it we is. We are really fighting. And it's objectively the funniest thing we've ever been a part of together as a team. So we we stood back from it. And we were like, it's pretty hysterical watching how frustrated we are with each other. What if this was a whole show? So what's different about our show is that we're also competing against each other. So we're, we're the mascot of our team and um, we go head to head nonstop. And we're trying to win, you know, and each family that comes on and it can be a pandemic family, a group of friends, anyone who considers themselves family. It doesn't have to be mm -hmm. a Manson family. OK, that 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 might might end a little a little differently. Yeah. As you said it's a dangerous show, and Dax is fighting for his family. I'm fighting for my family at, to win a hundred thousand dollars, and we're getting ice ice buckets dumped on our head and down our back. They hook up a tube in this brain in this game called Brain Freeze with an ice, a big ice watery chunk that has to go down your back and down your pants, and it is one of the most uncomfortable things I've ever done. And we did it eighteen times in a row. Oh my god! It, it would seem. And correct me if I'm wrong, but that you're tempting fate as a couple by, I mean, couples have enough conflict without adding to it and having a national television audience watching. Are, is there any, were there any, has, was there any hesitation in doing this? 
Who I think what you're edge? I think what you're saying is it's arrogant. And you know what? You're dead right. <laughs> <laughs> it's very <laughs> cocky of us to leave a house with a six year old and an eight year old. Well, we're already going to kill each other. And then we we drive 12 minutes to Warner Brothers and then just do it for another 16 hours straight. Yeah. Um, Well, hey, let's stress test this thing. Let's see what it'll bear. What we're really made of. (laughs) You know, Kristen, you mentioned, you know, like some pandemic families. You know, we've all we're all coming out of this. Uh, Are there any lessons that we might have learned during the pandemic that you see? In with these these families that that show that they've learned something during this stressful time. I mean, I would say that a lot of the families that we were we had on the show, they they were very close. They were teammates and like to to the best definition of that. And I think that that's because a lot of these people that came on the show, they spent the last 18 months together. And I mean, certainly learned what we learned, which is that patience and grace is key. I mean, whenever, when life is busy, you can um, make an argument that you're allowed to be snappy with someone, but when you're just sitting in a house, you're sort of like, I've got two choices. I could be frustrated with this person because what they're doing is annoying me, or I could just choose patience and grace and, and give everybody a little bit of a free pass like I would be asking for. And so the, the family seemed, I mean, there was a group of Bruins football players. There was firefighters. A, uh, a group of firefighters that had spent the whole pandemic even like working together because that stuff doesn't shut down just because we have to stay indoors. Um, a group of sisters that spent it together. But you're right. Um, as the saying goes, you know, you find out who your friends are in adversity, not in triumph. So I think for the last year, people have They've really figured out like, oh, yeah, who, who would I pod with? Who, who can I count on to do this? Who do I trust? There's So, yeah, I think I think a lot of people have come out of this with a sense of like who who that core is. I'm, I'm fascinated by um, your 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 the choices you guys make in that. So here you are uh, squished together during this pandemic with your kids. You're uh, and, you know, admittedly driving each other nuts. So you get out of the pandemic and the first thing you do is get into an even smaller space in an RV and and start driving. So w- explain that choice to me. Okay, okay. I mean, is do you have is this a 6-hour segment cuz I, I got to start it. by saying I'm 46, time is boogieing by. I mean, it is blowing by. I'm sure it's going even at a, at a faster rate for you. I'm coming I'm old. To, well, not just that you're old, but time is, it, it collapses on itself, right? So a year for me is one forty-sixth of my life. For my eight-year-old, it's one-eighth of her life. Those are different. So I'm obsessed with novelty. I think when you are experiencing new sights, new smells, new tastes, that you are actually slowing time down. You're taking in more data and you're slowing time down. My example would be you go on vacation. First three days, you're like, man, I feel like I've been here for a week. Last two days are like that. So if you just keep that motorhome moving, you never get to those last two days. And and do you feel the same way, Kristen? I do. I do. Well, that's also a very, very good argument. And in our house, the best, most sound argument wins. So it's I can make arguments that like, well, it might be slightly uncomfortable in the motorhome. And then when I look at those two arguments in comparison, I'm like, yeah, I'd take a tiny amount of discomfort, which it really isn't for a time stretching out and for some reason our family the four of us have learned how to cooperate in a small space better than a large space and oddly i would say that brings back to the pandemic lesson you make different choices when you can't escape when you are with someone face to face all the time you choose wisely i feel like and you can we we were we got along great the girls like barely fought I, I think we do have some some history of like as a little team, we'll go away, Kristen will go work somewhere. So all four of us go to a hotel for some period of time. We fly together. We do I think we've had like a, a lot of little uh compartment. One of yeah, them's knocking at the, at the door, even though they know you they take can't it. You come take the question, I'll get the child. Hold on. She said, we're on TV right now. We're on the news. And she said, okay. <laughs> and and this, I'm sure, is about the doll's birthday. They, we found She's out yesterday. She's all in the bag with some 
Sweet. her doll's birthday and now we have to order a cake and she wrapped like six presents yesterday and now we got to celebrate she's taking it very seriously anyway wow that's, yeah, we're, that's she's good. planning a bacchanalia for this but family. as teammates as dax was saying because we travel as a family when he works or when i work we support each other no matter how crazy the idea so we will be celebrating gloria the doll's birthday this evening today is now a podcast available every morning listen wherever you get your podcasts Local meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Yeah, who's this? Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Good evening from New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Here's, here's the thing, and you talk about, Dax, you talk about uh, uh, gender assumptions. And I think people always assume that boys smell worse than girls. And as the father of two girls and a boy, uh, I, I can tell you that that's not necessarily so. And I understand that there's an issue in, in your house with that. Well, they, sm they smell like vinegar. And I, I can't compare them to boys, but it's all kids. And that's, I think you're referring to when we bathe them. We just, it's a smell test. It's a foot smell test. And then you just pop them in the water or the shower or the bath. Yeah. But prior to that, it's it's too much work. So it's every couple. Especially of days. in the summer, so something happens in the summer, right? You you loosen up the bedtime. All of a sudden, you re we realize like, oh, geez, now we're watching TV with these kids at like 11 p.m. This went off the rails. And then you're also you're just bathing them far less, and you're kind of leaving them in charge of it, which they're bad at it. And then yeah, a whiff will hit you, and you go, oh, it's time. Yeah. In fact, it's, it was probably time yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but here we are. Is so was that the uh, uh, impetus for your line of Hello Bello for like soaps and, and products for kids? Get them clean. Our kids were our kids were because we, um, you know, we, we were overpaid and we live in Los Angeles, so we had we had our uh, any product that might have been fantastic we had access to we could afford, and at a certain point we we're like. Huh. This it's kind of weird if you live in Michigan, where we're from, and you are middle class, you probably don't can't have all the stuff we had. And we were just in a really weird position where we could approach a Walmart and, and start with the economy of scale that allowed us to do really premium, healthy, organic stuff for half the price of the other stuff. We say it's your mom's ingredients at your dad's prices. And we make the <laughs> amazing diapers. Hello Bella has the best diapers. And they come in a diaper box when you get the bundle that turns into a toy. Like it'll turn into an airplane. It's like a foldable box. So it's race car. Yeah, or a race car or a lemonade stand. We're trying to make it very cool. Or and kindling the for your fire in the winter. Oh, it's even better. <laughs> Want. And then a lot it's of like, good... it's like the transformers of 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 kids stuff. Yeah, we're trying to make it fun and yeah. all the stuff you would need for a baby or a kid. And we're putting a lot of thought into it and uh, trying to bring it to the masses because it's about half the price of anything else. So the, the girls aren't babies anymore. What what now that you're they're out there and they're they're these independent, free thinking, free range kids. What 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 are they coming home with? It still just kind of gobsmacks you sometimes. Well, currently, in into our great horror, our eight year old has taken an interest in musical theater. So, what's great is you know, 
this is really, really what you're di- what we're, we're dying for as parents is like you push all this stuff on them zero to eight. You know, why don't you try soccer? Why don't you try this? You know, our life was just taking them all these places they didn't want to be. And this, and we did not push acting because we want nothing to do with it until they're older. We, I, we don't want to drive to auditions and stuff. So lo and behold, our just she's studying like crazy. She's learning like reams of dialogue and songs and we're, and she's just on fire for it. And we're, we're, we're not a part of that. It's just happening. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of interesting. Yeah. It's a very, like, it's a parenting theory where you just follow the kid. And so we kind of got to follow it. She's loving it. She's doing a lot of little plays. I shouldn't say little, she's doing a lot of plays and she's doing a great job. Yeah. And the younger one is all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> we don't know what her deal is yet. She's planning. She's she, apparently she's an event planner in the making because she has a birthday party for a stuffed animal at least once a week. Yeah. Hey, everybody's got to have a skill. Welcome to today all day. All day. Today all day. All day. This is a long oh, way of man. asking. Yeah, who's your okay. favorite character you've ever all played? The right. unicorn. The unicorn. You gotta have the unicorn. <laughs> what is she right there? That's why you're saying all these nice. Yeah. Things. She gave me the the look. Sorry to disturb your day. Everyone's mad at you, Willie. Better make this fast. I don't want the wrath of Luna. When I see you, I always think, I wonder what his quote would be. Give us six minutes and we'll ask as many questions as we can. Welcome to Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Cold Cuts. Hi, buddy Cal. Cooking with me. Dad's no babysit. It's called parenting. What was the first book you remember loving? Heart Smart Today. With simple exercises to strengthen your heart. Make the most of your beach days. It's all about the tracksuit now. How good do they look? I now pronounce you husband and wife. Kiss the bride. This morning, a story of people helping people. You've received tons of letters from people who have been inspired. Let's do the weather out. <laughs> OK. All you got to do is say, it's cold, it's warm, it's raining, it's snowing. That's it. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate yes. on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody good, and that's it! Yeah. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. (laughs) Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate (laughs) on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody good, and that's it! These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello. Lizzo, you put a smile on every single face. It feels like Christmas and my birthday or something. (laughs) Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? So your parents, your producers, your, your actors, actresses, your, your game show hosts, what, I mean, you guys leave this crazy life. Is there anything that you've got on the bucket list that you haven't done yet that you want to tackle? I'm recently obsessed with Formula One, so I do intend to go to uh, see some races in foreign countries, which um, my lovely bride is going to facilitate because she took a movie in England in in September. And the conversation literally went like this. She said, so I was pitched a movie. It happens in England. It's going to be with my favorite singer, Ben Platt. Uh, It's short. I've already figured out what Formula One races you could go to. If you're in England, you could base out of there. Like she came with the big carrot. 
And I was like, hold on a second. So I might get to go to Turkey to the Formula One race. And she said, yeah, I think that could happen. And I was like, you should take this movie. This is, it sounds like a great movie. <laughs> because we do, when we take any work, we make decisions as a group. Like nobody mm-hmm. just something like, I, none of, neither of us would go to New Zealand for six months to shoot. It would just be crazy stressful on our family so I knew I had to come up with a really good pitch if I wanted to do this movie and thankfully he bit and so you know we'll be traveling safely this fall um I won't I'm gonna um, be juggling chainsaws the whole flight yeah but anything we haven't done I don't think so I don't know we don't strategize to be honest it's pretty loosey-goosey around here it is and I gotta say it's a great great freedom we I lamented about time with moving faster but the freedom of getting older is is that i don't have aspirations anymore i there's no one i'm trying to be we're just here uh, sometimes someone calls and says you want to come over and do this thing and uh, and then we do it like it's 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 transitioned at least for me where it's like the, the the goal has kind of been a race and it's i love it so now it's just really about process every time like yeah. would that be fun for us would would we enjoy doing that and well, that's a humongous luxury that is new to us yeah i'm i'm a huge animation fan and i would say you could, you both have some pretty cool animation projects coming up some cooler than others but yeah <laughs> uh, I, yeah i'm in the paw patrol movie which i did the sole goal of having something my kids would excited be excited to see me in the very egotistical driven decision and as luck would have it in about the two years it takes to make a movie i've noticed we're not watching paw patrol as much as i would like i had this whole fantasy where they were going to be cutting down the days till friday i was going to take them to the movies we're going to do popcorn the whole night and i'm like hey guys no one wants to check out paw patrol this weekend <laughs> Wait, you guys are watching sitcoms? When did this happen? <laughs> How about you, Chris? Well, I, um, two of my friends um, had this idea to create a, a kid's cartoon in the wake of a lot of arts programs being cut from public schools because the budgets just aren't there. And music was so pivotal to me. It brought me to acting. It brought me to uh, so many different things in my life. So we created this show called Do Re Me. It'll be on Amazon in September. And Do Re and Me. Do Re and Me. I play me. Um, and it's about three little songbirds. And it is entertainment for children. But we have pushed in a lot, a lot of there's music theory ideas. They live in this place called Bebopsburg where like instruments grow on trees. We talk about different instruments. Then we talk about different types of music from around the world. And it's really a music education class. But masked as a kid's cartoon. So your kids are sort of absorbing all these things that data and science tells us helps their brain with math, with communication, with social activities, like music actually does that for your brain. It's why they play Little Einstein for babies when they're in the womb. It really does great things for your brain. And so, yeah, these three little songbirds, and then we'll have like games to go along with it that will be educational where the kids can make their own music and they can learn how to, you know, have teammates in a band and stuff. So we're, we're really hoping that um, fills the gap of music education for kids because I think every kid deserves it. Welcome back to you today. We got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it. Yeah. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Man, is this? From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now.
I love the title Queen Pins. I mean, it's just, it's perfect. Now, tell me about this. It's a baller title. Well, it's, it's a true story uh, about these suburban housewives who um, started, fell down on their luck, started a counterfeit coupon organization, and they laundered $40 million. And you can read about it in the news. And um, Aaron and Gita, these beautiful filmmakers, who's a husband and wife team, made it into a script. And I shot it with Kirby Howell Baptiste, who's one of my favorite actresses ever. This is project number five with her, and I will continue to work with her. So it was really fun. Um, it's got Paul Walker Hauser, Vince Vaughn, and it's just a really fun Queen Pins comedy about these girls trying to evade the law and uh, make some money. And I had so much fun doing it. And, and, and Dax, you know, one of the, the, the great pleasures of technology of these podcasts and your podcast, we, you know, time in and time out uh, is really, it's like this whole other version of you, yet it is you. Uh, do, are you, are you surprised at how, how much people love this podcast? I mean, it really is something that it seems like maybe you did on a lark, but my gosh, it is terrific. Um, thank you so much. It's a humongous surprise. My The trajectory of my working career has been work really hard for a couple of years and then have the movie come out on Friday and then want to die on Saturday. So that's <laughs> my my work reward. Uh, most of memory is a little, a little skewed. And, and uh, So yeah, to do something that I worked less hard on and that was really successful is very um, disorienting. I don't know. But I will say, I, I think any credit that I could take, I would just have to give to AA because I think my original goal in the podcast was like, oh, I get to go to these meetings every week. It's all men. They're sharing openly. They're admitting their 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 character defects, the ways they've erred and what they learned from it. And I'm picking up all this stuff and the level of vulnerability and honesty and support is so unique. Why doesn't everyone get to experience this? Why does one have to go be an alcoholic to, to have this peer experience? And so that was kind of the, the, the North Star of the podcast. Like, oh, what if we could do this in public? What if I could, I could start first and go like, oh, yeah, all these things happened to me. And this is how I did it. And I messed up this way. And, and get the ball rolling that way instead of like, how'd you win that Oscar? Boy, you were great. Like, I think there's some other conversation to be had that – um, is not unique to AA, but it was seemingly unique to the podcast space. So I, I think that's why. Well, I, I think the honesty of it and the, the just almost, I, I, and I don't mean this in a negative, but the rawness of it uh, is something that we're just not used to in, you know, in, in uh, uh, pop, you know, our pop social world right now. I try, I, I try when I'm feeling very lofty about myself, I think of it as, as a bit of an antidote to 140 characters, a curated life of pictures on Instagram, all these things that are snapshots. I'm much more interested in like the whole thing and not, not the, the time I have that you got the angle where I actually look like my nose is, is, is average size. Like that's not what we're after. <laughs> Well, uh, it, it, it succeeds, my friend, and to, bo to both of you. And, and before we go, I, I, I circle back to Family Game Fight. Um, what was it like? I mean, did you enjoy working together? More than ever on this one. Um, we just, in general, enjoy working together because, and we've said this before, so I sound a little inauthentic, but in life, Every day, there's nine options for us to disagree. We don't have a common goal. We don't want to eat at the same place. We are not in the mood to watch the same TV show. We don't have the same opinion on what we should do with the kids as parents. It's just a nonstop waterfall of compromise. When we work together, it's this rare bubble where we have the exact same goal. Like, we want the show to be great. And then even more than that, I... It's rare, I think, for partners in a marriage to be the benefactor of their partner's genius. So if I'm out on stage in this game show, it's on my shoulders and it's on hers. And she she is like 
she's John Stockton and I'm Malone or vice versa, or she's, you know, I'm Pittman. She's George. like, I look at her and I go, Oh my God, she's going to do more than half the lifting, maybe even more than half the lifting. She's so good at this. Watch her go. Oh my God. I feel uh, safe in like my teammate. It's just a rare thing. I think to get to experience in a marriage. I suck up. No, it was beautiful. But yeah, he's also said before, you don't get to go to work with your partner and see them thrive. If you're, if your partner is an accountant, you don't get to go to work and see them do a spreadsheet smash or add numbers. Yes, smash a spreadsheet. But we get to go to work and see each other be a sort of our in our element, be our best. And it's also the safety net as an actor to have someone you trust so much next to you. So having a common goal <clears throat> mitigates any sort of arguments that could happen or compromises because we're just on track with a common goal. And that's something really beautiful. And we always come home feeling very grateful for each other. Yeah, some people go away to like uh, <laughs> nice hotels for a week to rekindle and we we go shoot for 90 hours and we come out thinking like, yeah, I picked the right one. And you get paid. That's right, that's right. Oh, guys. And Doji, Doji coin, which we regret. Oh, well, you know, that's, but it's a cute little dog. So. <laughs> it is, that's, I think that's what gets us. Gets everybody. <laughs> guys, thanks so much, it's great to see you. Thank you, Thank you, Al. A lot of fun. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. A big hello and thanks for joining us for a special edition of Pop Star Plus. I'm Joe Fryer filling in for Carson. Today on the show, we're taking a moment to indulge in the past and revisit our favorite nostalgic summer movies. We're going to take a look at why we feel the way we do when we watch those older summer flicks. And you're killing me, Smalls. Today, contributor Donna Farrison spoke to the cast of a movie that defines the season, The Sandlot. We found out why it still resonates today. And to close out our special show, we've got our friend Chris Witherspoon, founder and CEO of Pop Viewers. He's counting down the most nostalgic summer movie scenes of all time. Stay with us for all of that. It'll be great. To kick things off, here's a deep dive into how watching nostalgic films makes us feel, especially during the heat of summer. Summer in itself is a great example of a trigger for nostalgia because it connotes many of the attributes that accompany nostalgia, such as longing for the carefreeness, the leisure uh, of childhood. But when you watch something like a movie that's set at summer camp, you've got so many stimuli there that are reminding us that in our hectic, busy lives, should we not occasionally take a break? So, uh, either of you by any chance know how to play poker? Yeah, never played it before. Roosevelt, how's that lanyard coming? Horrible. Film is a really good example of a medium that has all of the triggers for different kinds of sensory experiences, visual, auditory, such as the music in a film. And so you have all these varieties of sensory stimuli that help you to mentally transport yourself in two ways, by the way. Uh, one, when you're just remembering the past, you're transporting yourself back to that time. An interesting finding recently showed that when people just reminisce nostalgically, they even feel a little more uh, healthy and vibrant and they have more vitality. Why? Because when you transport yourself back, you're feeling a little bit of the feelings you felt when you were younger. Nostalgic films, especially for uh, looking back to your beloved favorite uh, childhood movies, those were a source of great comfort. Shut up! You're killing me, Smalls. Dear Darla, I hate your stinking guts. <laughs> Their time, up there. Down here, it's our time. It's our time down here. In fact, in film, for example, we believe from the research data that there are characters in movies that serve as surrogates for us. So when you watch a film that you loved in the past, not only are you remembering when you watched it, with whom did you watch it, the, the uh, conversations you had at the time, maybe you went out to the movies with friends or what have you. But in addition to that, as you watch characters in films play out their own problems and resolve them, 
through this vicarious resolution, you feel that hope and optimism, which is a lot like the happy ending of many stories that we've seen throughout our lives, right? If you wanted to uh, log them according to seasons of the year, for instance, summer is a great time. And uh, what operates as a nostalgic film, it could be something like Star Wars, uh, episode one, for a generation who saw that for the first time, either as children, teenagers, or young adults. And to some extent, it's transporting them, not just to the film and the enjoyment of the film, but also uh, it gives someone the ability to reflect upon what did it mean to me when I saw that as a kid and now what, did, what would I think of it now? So it's sometimes when we rewatch an old film, we're comparing our understanding as full-fledged adults or our understanding now, now that we've lived through so much with what we thought when we first saw it. Also for the elderly today, they might think back to the great summer films that were beach movies, you know, the parties on the beach and playing volleyball on the beach. When you think about transportation uh, mentally through a film, now you have added on to it that you might transport yourself to somebody else's past or to somebody else's experience, not necessarily your own. So uh, fiction can be ex enjoyed and benefited from even in terms of nostalgia. For instance, a lot of nostalgic films incorporate within the plot or within the character uh, lines, characters remembering back to their past. I can still recall our last summer. I still see it all. Walks along the Seine, laughing in the rain. I was the last one to move away. But when I did, the Sandlot was still there. And then when you watch that, then that prompts you to sort of mentally transport yourself with that character back to their past as well. So it's very rich. Film is a very rich medium. Our thanks to Professor Christine Batchel for sharing all of her findings and insights with us, a little better understanding of why those films make us feel so good. Still to come, even more nostalgia and more fun. Donna Farrison's chat with the Sandlot stars who played Yeah Yeah in Squids. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. These days, it feels like the news never stops. So let's get into it. What's happening right now, what it all means for you for an hour every day. It can be hard to keep up, so let's get started together. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Welcome back to our Pop Star Plus special all about nostalgic summer movies. Now, if you're a 90s kid, you'll remember the 1993 release of a movie about a ragtag pack who loved playing ball. And it changed how we think about summer forever. Today, contributor Donna Farrison spoke to two of the stars from The Sandlot, Chauncey Leopardi, who played Squints, and Marty York, who played Yeah Yeah. They shared the responses they still get about the movie set during a summer back in 1962. Was the summer you filmed The Sandlot the best summer of your life? It was for sure the best summer <laughs> of my life. Yeah, yeah. I don't think anything, you know, compares to it since then. And uh, 
I think we just had had a blast. It was summer camp for like two or three months that we filmed over the summer, and definitely, definitely the best. Year. Yeah, it was pretty great. It's hard to beat. Um, obviously, you know, I love my family, and I wouldn't want my wife to think that, uh, you know, my 11-year-old summer was the best summer of my life. But uh, it, it was pretty awesome, you know, hanging out with friends and having that experience, and then getting to share it with uh, the rest of the world forever. It's just a, it's a pretty, a pretty amazing thing. This film represents the best of summer, the 4th of July celebrations, the carnivals, kids playing ball, the s'mores, you name it. There's so many different elements. Why do you think The Sandlot is a film that has defined summertime for a lot of people? It takes people back to, a, to an era of the United States that where kids went outside and they played and when the sun went down, that's when they came, went home. I want you to get out into the fresh air and make some friends. Run around, scrape your knees, get dirty. You had adventures during the day. It'll be 30 years next year, first of all. How does that feel for you guys? It's amazing. I mean, you know, anytime you do a film, you never know what the results are going to be. But to still be here talking about this 30 years later and to, uh, to see it still affecting people's lives for the better is kind of, that's kind of why you're in the arts. You know, it's the, the reason that you want to do, that's what you set out when you, you have passion about a project is to hope that you get one that, that you know, changes things, you know, forevermore. So mm -hmm. it, it's a blessing. And we, uh, we appreciate all the love and support that we've gotten over the years. What were your favorite scenes to film for each of your characters? I loved like all of the baseball stuff, obviously was a lot of fun. When we played the other team, it was a blast. Filming the whole chase scene, we did that for like two weeks. So just the dog chasing Benny and all the different stuff. That was a lot of fun as well. I think that there's like something to find that was cool about everything. And uh, even in the treehouse stuff, that treehouse was amazing. This is when they really built sets for film still. There was no green screens or, or you know, or anything like that. So that was all like real craftsmanship. Somebody, a carpenter, the, the, uh, the construction guys on set actually built those sets. So they were so cool and like so in depth, uh, Mr. Myrtle's house. And it was a really cool time in filmmaking because you still had all of the crafts really showing, you know, showcasing their work. Whereas now maybe things are a little bit more relying on, on computer generated software and, and stuff like that. So it was a cool time to, to kind of see them you know, fabricate this uh, this really cool film and uh, these really cool sets. Obviously, my my favorite scene was going over the fence to come face to face with the beast and uh, being on that crane. And it's really cool because you know back then, you know, kids could do their own stunts, which would never happen nowadays. And just like a lot of the stuff that I didn't even see till the final picture came out, the Fourth of July scene, you know. We filmed that with just literally lights and gels that they put in front to make it look like fireworks were going off. You know, when we filmed that, it didn't seem that iconic to me until you put Ray Charles to it, until you put the, the fireworks in the sky. And uh, you, when we saw the final product, we were like, wow, like that really like, you know, that's an amazing scene. So it's just movie magic. God done shed his grace on thee. What kind of memories do people you know, tell you that they have that are related to the Sandlot. What do the fans come up to you and say? Everybody that relates to squints that has the glasses or like, you know, I get a lot of the pictures and the photos. Sometimes as growing up, having glasses is always like a, you know, something that people could be a little reserved about or, or feel like they get picked on a little bit. So it's cool to have that that cool character that people can relate to that, that makes them feel um, like this is a, a superpower, not, not not the opposite. How do you think the Sandlot has helped empower young people to feel more included, be more inclusive, and, you know, feel okay to embrace their differences? It's awesome because this is a bunch of uh, kids of all shapes, colors, and sizes. They're all different. They all have their own little, their little thing. And, you know, the main character is a kid that's filling out a place and Andrew coming from somewhere else and really not fitting in. And it starts off with, so like, his struggle of, like, gone you know, trying to connect with his stepfather and trying to connect with these kids in this but new neighborhood. And uh, it takes a guy like Benny, who is obviously a, a very strong character and an amazing baseball player and uh, a total star to just say, you know, leave him alone. We need an extra guy and this guy's, this guy's gonna be it, you know? So it's about including people regardless of, you know, 
what the, the masses feel. So I think it has a lot to say about, you know, real American values, because that's what America is. It's a melting pot of different cultures and different people that, that you know, find common ground to create a better life for themselves. Really cool to hear from those two. We're going to share more from them after the break, including what it was like to film that famous pool scene featuring Squints and Wendy Peppercorn. And good evening from New Orleans. Nice to go really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back to you today. we got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. For breaking news in our changing world, download the NBC News app. Welcome back to our special episode of Pop Star Plus. Let's pick back up with Donna Farrison's conversation with two stars from The Sandlot, Marty York and Chauncey Leopardi, who spoke about that very pivotal pool scene and the impact it's had on young kids today. Chauncey, you were talking about, you know, Wendy Peppercorn and that pool scene, which is so iconic when your character almost drowns and then gets saved by the lifeguard that everyone has a crush on. What do you remember from shooting that scene? God, it looks like a dead fish. Uh, it was really cold. Mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was a really hot summer, but uh, during the time that we shot the pool scene, it had dipped down into like the 70s and we were shooting early mornings for the light and uh, it was freezing cold. So in a lot of those scenes, you can see us like, shivering in the pool or I know it was like a big anticipation for me leading up to that I kept asking the director you know is today the day is today the day <laughs> you know what I mean it was my first my first kissing scene so you know wow pretty exciting that is exciting that's amazing just as we talked about earlier too so much that has happened or the emotions that are evoked from the sandlot translate into real life as well. On the Today Show, Hoda recently interviewed the three boys who had saved the dad who became unconscious underwater in their pool. It's an amazing story. They performed CPR on him, saved his life, and they credited learning CPR through watching The Sandlot and through that specific scene. Now, who took a CPR class? Raise your hand. Nobody? But you did know, because what was one of your favorite movies? The Sandlot. What was your reaction to that news? That's just incredible. You know, like, here we are 30 years later, and, and something that someone saw that we did 30 years ago saved their father's life. I mean, it, it just, it, it makes you want to tear up because it's such a beautiful thing. And, uh, you know, wherever we get the information from, it, it's great, you know? So to be the, the the force that helped them do that for their father, you know, I, I'll never forget it. Every time I come across a fan of the Sandlot, they always talk about it in a way that 
you know, they feel so comfort comforted and cozy when watching it. It brings them back to a different time. Why do you think people feel so comforted when watching The Sandlot? It's timeless. The way David Mickey Evans, the writer and director, shot it, he told the DP, Tony Richmond, he told him, I want it to look like Kodak chromatic film. So that's like an old, uh, you know, very pop arty type of film from the from the 60s. And he said, I want it to look like that. And I think because of the setting, how do you have done it in the 90s when we shot it and, and placed it present day? I don't think it would have lasted and stood the test of time. It's like a Bel Air. It's like a, a 57 Chevy, you know, it's something that the lines on it are going to be clean forever. And no matter what, you're always going to get a nostalgic feeling when you go see these these old cars at these car shows and just the storied time in American history. And be, and because it's it's just frozen in time, I think that it, it, it stands the test of time because it is a time capsule, like Marty said. It just, it takes you to a happy place where, you know, good or bad, we felt like everything was was a little bit simpler. Thank you to Marty and Chauncey for hanging out with us. Still to come, we've queued up some of the most nostalgic summer movie scenes of all time. Do we got any Parent Trap fans out there? Stick with us. Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! Yeah. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Welcome back to our special episode of Pop Start Plus. We are diving into everything you need to know about nostalgic summer movies. And who better to guide us along than Chris Witherspoon? He is the founder and CEO of Pop Viewers, and he's about to take us on a lovely trip down memory lane with some of the most nostalgic summer movie scenes ever. Is there anything that beats the warm weather, the long sun-filled days and fun that comes with summertime? Whether you went to camp or hung out by the pool, spent time with family and friends, or had seven jobs like me, summer was always filled with terrific memories of growing up. Unfortunately, we'll never be kids again, but luckily, we'll always have movies to turn to that transport us back to those days, no matter what decade you grew up in. Let's count down as we watch some of the best nostalgic summer movie scenes of all time. First up, Weekend at Bernie's. It's an absolute classic. Now grab your sunblock and flip flops because you'll be wanting to enjoy a weekend at the beach after watching this one. In it, Jonathan Silverman and Andrew McCarthy play friends who are invited for a weekend at their boss's opulent beach house. Lots of shenanigans ensue that ultimately lead to their boss, Bernie's, death. But to avoid ruining their weekend, Richard and Larry pretend he's still alive. Let's take a look at the clip. You're probably right. Get it together, Bernie. Oh, Bernie. Here we go, shoot, move it over a little bit, okay, baby? Asshole. I don't understand why we have to move him, Rich. Oh, don't ask me any questions, Larry. Just move him. Oh. Here we go. Ready? I can't believe I'm touching a dead body. Use your boss. Come yeah. on. Let's go. Whoa. Oh, Bernie. <laughs> <laughs> I want to get her up. Oh, Bernie. You're all just done. Come doing. on. That's what she calls some dead weight. Let's go. Come on, he's crazy. Here we go. Wait, is there an award for playing the best dead guy? If so, Terry Kaiser deserves it. If you're looking to laugh like there's no tomorrow, add this film to your summer watch list. Next up, one of almost everyone's favorites, The Notebook. 
Ryan Gosling and Rachel McAdams killed these roles as lovers who were always meant to be together. Who could forget the moment when Noah and Ali reunited after seven years apart? Did he just pick that boat up with his bare hands? I think he did. It wasn't over for me. I waited for you for seven years. Now it's too late. I wrote you 365 letters. I wrote you every day for a year. You wrote me? Yes. It wasn't over. It still isn't over. That's a kiss right there. Ooh, talk about a hot girl summer. Even all that rain couldn't cool those two down. On to another fun one, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Now if you watch this as a teen, then you got tons of ideas on how to spend the perfect day playing hooky. Matthew Broadwick stars, of course, as Ferris Bueller, and the movie starts a month before Ferris's high school graduation. Ferris ends up at a museum, a baseball game, a fancy restaurant, you name it. One of the most hilarious moments was when his teacher realizes he's missing from class. Let's watch this clip. Anderson. Here. Bueller. 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 Um, he's sick. My best friend's sister's boyfriend's brother's girlfriend heard from this guy who knows this kid is going with the girl who saw Ferris pass out at 31 Flavors last night. Now she can That's lie. Pretty serious. That's a good lie. Thank you, Simone. No problem whatsoever. Fry. <laughs> oh my God. Ben Stein's boring monotone delivery gets me every time. And P.S. Find yourself a coworker that will be your alias next time you want to dish work on a summer Friday. Everybody needs one of those. Now, Clueless is one of those timeless movies following a group of popular high school friends. If you didn't know, it's a modernization of Jane Austen's Emma, and it's got an amazing cast. Alicia Silverstone and Paul Rudd, and of course, the late, great Brittany Murphy. Just to name a few. Check out this scene where Cher, played by Silverstone, makes the case for not participating in PE class. Earth to Cher! Come in, Cher! Oh, my God. Ms. Stoger? I would just like to say that physical education in this school is a disgrace. I mean, standing yes, in gym line outfits. for 40 minutes is hardly aerobically effective. I doubt I've worked off the calories in a stick of carefree gum. Come on, Cher. <laughs> I feel like in this scene, Cher could have just said, uh, as if, and been done with it. Clueless does take place throughout all four seasons, but real talk, those Beverly Hills vibes will have you feeling like you're on vacation. Another fun summer love story with lots of dancing. You guessed it, dirty dancing. Jennifer Grey and Patrick Swayze play Baby and Johnny, and the two fall in love after being paired as dance partners. Now, one of the most iconic movie lines ever came from the scene where Johnny proclaims his love for Baby before the movie's final epic dance performance. Let's watch. As the mountains stand, or our hands recline, Nobody puts baby in a corner. Some Tell him. But the heart needs a vacation. Where... Sorry about the disruption, folks. But I always do the last dance of the season. But this year, somebody told me not to. So I'm going to do my kind of dancing with a great part. Sit down. Not dance. only a terrific dancer, dirty dance. Somebody who's taught me <laughs> that there are people willing to stand up for other people no matter what it costs them. Mmm. The best parts yet to come. I am declaring it now. Nobody puts baby in the corner is one of the most iconic movie lines of all time. Try to tell me it's not. Alas, if only all of our summers could end with a sultry summer dance routine. And next up, one of my favorites, Poetic Justice. Janet Jackson, Regina King, and Tupac Shakur gave legendary performances in this film. They play friends who road trip to Oakland, California, and basically fall in love along the way. Poetic Justice is another one of those films that will definitely have you crying and laughing, but I love this scene where the friends crash a random family barbecue. Let's take a look. I don't think so. My cousins, my cousins. Look at my family over here. My cousins. What's up, cousin? How you doing, boy? 
cousin. What's up, cousin? What's up? Why well, ain't seen you and I don't know where. Janet Jackson knows how to give a good stank face. And sometimes all you gotta say is cousin. And you guys, I'm pleading the fifth on if I've ever crashed a barbecue for a burger. Please don't judge me. And last, but certainly not least, I doubt you've ever gone a summer without watching this one. The Parent Trap. The remake stars Lindsay Lohan and tells the story of twin sisters who meet and realize they are really sisters at summer camp. The moment they see each other and realize how much they look alike is priceless. Let's take a look. <gasps> A new camp champ, come on. They look alike, Emma. Those freckles, those freckles, those freckles get me every time. Why is everyone staring? <gasps> Do we have Kleenex see handy, see please? What? I need them. This part gets me every time. Resemblance between you and me? <laughs> oh my God, every time that movie gets me. You know, I watched this movie so many times as a kid and you couldn't tell me Lindsay Lohan didn't have a twin sister in real life. It's definitely one to add to the rotation, y'all. Okay, we just gave you a taste of a few surefire summer flicks. Now I know we outside again, but with this summer heat, nothing beats a good old movie night. We hope you have a blast watching or re-watching some of our favorite picks. So many great recommendations. Our thanks to Chris for bringing them to us and for giving us all a boost with your terrific reactions. We should mention you can download the Pop Viewers app from the App Store. That was our Pop Start Plus Nostalgic Summer Movie Special here on Today All Day. Thank you for tuning in. Hope you had as much fun as we did revisiting some of our favorite films from the past. It's been a pleasure to bring them to you. Have a great day. Oh, hi. We're so happy that you're checking us out on Today All Day. Welcome to our favorite streaming show. I hope it's yours too. Today in 30. Yes, it is August 1st. I can't believe it. Host, can you? No, I know. I What's can't. happening? Well, it is a new month of today too. So why not have a new walking challenge? We're going to get to that in just a bit. But first, we start things off in Kentucky. More rain, new flood watches. They're only adding to concerns there. Our team is on the scene and we'll bring you a full report. Also had this morning, have you ever been to the metaverse? <laughs> no, well, no, I haven't. Well, Craig has. And in our new series, he's going to take us inside it. We're going to see firsthand why it's being called the next frontier of the internet. Cool. All that plus on the fourth hour, we celebrated National Girlfriend's Day with a woman who's creating incredible friendships through Facebook. So happy Girlfriend's Day to you. I love and that. To you. It's time for Today, Today in 30. 30. Let's start with NBC's Jesse Kirsch in Kentucky for us and the latest on the situation there, the death toll rising. Jesse, good morning. Savannah, good morning. Another tough start to the day here in Kentucky. The damage is unbelievable when we see it up close. This building behind me is one that we examined over the weekend. The man who owns the property was with us and we looked over there. The water line, you can still see it. That is over my head and I am more than six feet tall. I'm six foot one. So you can imagine how high the water was over there at one point. And the damage here is com comparatively better to what we've seen in other areas that have been hit so hard. This morning, a disastrous swath of destruction across Eastern Kentucky. Over two dozen now dead after horrific floods ripped entire houses from the ground and swallowed neighborhoods. And it's all gone. All gone. The devastation catastrophic. Homes and roads crumbling. Some houses literally swept away by surging waters. There's still people that they can't find. We're lucky enough to be alive. And this morning, the death toll is climbing. At least 28 people killed, even more likely dead. With the level of water, uh, we're going to be finding bodies for weeks. Among the lives tragically lost, four children, all siblings. Eight-year-old Madison, six-year-old Riley Jr., four-year-old Nevaeh, and two-year-old Chance, all killed, according to a relative. As the water recedes, grim searches continue. But still signs of hope as rescuers search the area. One family of five, including an 83-year-old woman trapped in their attic, according to the Wolf County Search and Rescue Team, lifted to safety by the Kentucky National Guard. Governor Andy Bashir, who visited the disaster zone Sunday, doubling the National Guard's boots on the ground. It's going to be really hard on each and every one of these families. Saying the Guard has already made over a thousand rescues by air. 
sometimes it takes that individual soldier or airman to get up in these back areas, knock on doors, and make sure everybody's okay. Now, residents are salvaging what they can. Some only left with memories. We've lost four houses, a couple of vehicles, all our farm equipment. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. We'll meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. Hey, who's this? Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Top Story with Tom Yamas, weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? You came into this job saying you were going to fight crime. Have you been successful? Found a way to put that. Can you update us on the status of negotiations? Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. We're kicking off a special series across the platforms of NBC News. Inside the metaverse. What is the metaverse? You ask. Good question. We, we ask. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's the next phase of the internet where avatars are used to hold meetings, to shop, socialize, <laughs> and Craig. You did it. You hung out in the metaverse. How was it? You came back. You lived to tell. I lived to tell. That's that's my avatar. Um, that's Snoop not my Dogg? avatar. No, <laughs> that's Snoop Dogg. But you may have heard that celebrities like Snoop Dogg. They're buying real estate in the metaverse. There was even a, a best metaverse video category at the MTV Music Awards. It may sound like something straight out of a sci-fi film, but folks, this, this is the future. The metaverse, the next frontier of the internet. From virtual weddings to church service. Focus your mind. Justin Bieber gave a concert. Different. Jay-Z, Lady Gaga, Bella Hadid, all embracing the virtual trend. Vishal Shah works at Facebook's parent company, now simply called Meta, to reflect its new focus, investing billions into this emerging technology. In the simplest of terms, explain what the metaverse is. It's the next phase of how we experience the internet. And the main difference between today and that metaverse experience is this feeling of being together with someone. Using virtual reality, you can hold a business meeting or hang out with friends from anywhere in the world, and it feels like you're in the same room. I just put it on like this. I experienced the evolution firsthand when we move the interview from our screens to our avatars. Oh, for sure. Testing one of Meta's virtual reality experiences called Horizon Worlds, a unique online space you can access using their $300 headset. The best is this. Put your hands up. What? What? I love that. Only upper body exists for Meta avatars in these early stages. And the audio is so real. It's, I mean, it's, it's like we are just a few feet from each other. Yeah, and actually it's all spatial. That's pretty cool. We played a game Meta created called Paddle Golf. <laughs> pretty good, Craig, was... pretty good. In the hall. Oh, show off. In the hall. Oh, baby! Why do we need yet another escape from reality? I don't think anything we're building replaces in-person kind of physical connection. But we do spend a lot of our time in digital experiences, and we want to make those digital experiences better, more immersive. 
Just like the internet, anyone can enter the metaverse, so it's difficult to police. It does sound like sort of the Wild West to a certain extent. For parents who are thinking, oh my goodness, here's one more thing I'm going to have to protect my child from. Just like anything else, it's about having a conversation with your kids, putting in the right controls. It, we can't ignore the fact that technology is evolving. You can also experience the metaverse simply using a computer, no headset needed. This one is from a different website and it's called Decentraland, a web-based metaverse with 300,000 monthly users that's also free. What does Decentraland offer? You made friends, you can buy land, sell wearables or virtual clothes. There are a lot of parties and events people throw, so I think it's really a multi-purpose world. While skeptics ask, why do we need to live as avatars buying virtual stuff? In this next era of the internet, the metaverse will transform how we work, shop, and socialize. Gigi Graziosi Casimiro produced Metaverse's first fashion week in Decentraland. She took me on a tour of this virtual world that lets you type and teleport into different locations. You look great, by the way. I like your pink suit. And this actually looks, it looks sort of like me. I like it so much, I'm going to dance for you. This is my happy dance. This is the luxury fashion district. So why don't you walk a little bit around so I can show you a little bit of the stores. Next up, a jazz club. I did not know that you had all those moves. Uh, is that the funky chicken I'm doing? Okay. I love it. I love it. I hear you guys have a uh, whiskey distillery. We do have a whiskey distillery. You've been holding out. Oh, this is cool. Here we can walk around and actually see the distillery from inside. I enjoy your virtual distillery, not so much your virtual bourbon. So cheers, Gigi. Cheers to that. We are back with Start Today. I got to tell you, we've had such an incredible response to our walking challenges. Well, guess what? This morning, we want to introduce you to full body strength training, which is a key element to help support our walking. And all summer long, you guys have been just overwhelming. More than 74,000 of you follow the plan on Facebook. I've been doing it, doing it too. Just scan the QR code. You can sign up for our newsletter, which includes the August workout and a printable calendar uh, that's uh, suitable for framing and <laughs> trading with your friends. Fitness trainer Stephanie Mansour, who leads our Start Today Facebook group, is here along with some of our great Start Today Facebook members. Uh, now, before we start out and get to you, Steph, I want to—we've got a, just some um, amazing folks here. We've first of all got uh, Elizabeth Rogdakis, uh, Lillian Ma Mora, and Kim Anata uh, Atanasu. Yeah. Here. I told you I'd get that wrong, but anyway, we finally did. So uh, you're all cancer survivors. Yeah, we're cancer survivors, and we work for Northwell. Okay. And, and we're nurses. Yeah, and, and you're nurses, so you're doing God's work. We appreciate it. And, and I got to tell you. You know, I was, I'm a cancer, prostate cancer survivor, and my doctor wanted me walking you know, the first week I was back. How has it helped? How did that help? I you? had surgery and was walking a week later also. Walking has um, allowed us to encompass many things, mm -hmm. one of them being um, walking for health. Right. Walking for sanity. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we all are in we stressful need that jobs. Now. <laughs> yeah. um, we worked right through COVID, and walking was a way we got out, uh -huh. shared supported each other right. okay and with the group now I feel I'm a part of a group larger than myself yeah oh, you, that's know, terrific. Had, you know hitting that Facebook page in the morning mm -hmm. and getting whatever tips are coming through to us Isn't it, did you all like getting that trying to get it done first thing in the day yes. this yes. way you yes. know you yes. check the box yes. and you feel like you've accomplished something yes. before you even go out the door really appreciate it okay so Steph mm -hmm. how important the walking is fantastic you you've got a future in this business <laughs> All right, there you go. As long as you don't come you after me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, Steph, why is it we, we've done upper body or lower, lower body, but uh -huh. the whole full body thing is yes. important, too? Yes, so we are going to put this all together this month for everyone. So everyone love the upper body workouts, right, ladies? Yes. yes. All right. Everyone loves the walking, so uh -huh. we're going to step it up a little bit. We're going to do some lower body exercises as well this month, Al, and that's going to help us propel faster, uh -huh. propel easier in our walks and also help us with balance and stability. And how important is strength training? Strength training is hugely important, especially as we get older.
shoulder. We're trying to really tighten up those muscles to uh -huh. firm up the bones. Right. And it's helping us to not, you know, have more trips and falls. It okay. helps us to get up and down from the couch easier. Well, Makes us feel better in general, right? We like that. Okay, so what's our first All right, move? so the first exercise, we're actually going to start with the upper body with okay. these dumbbells. So you can work out anywhere, anytime this month. All you need are a set of dumbbells. We've got uh -huh. three pounds here, Al. You and I are separate up with six pounds, Yikes. all right? We're going to hug the elbows in. The first move is serve the platter. So we serve the platter forward. We open it out to the side, get a little chest stretch, okay. come back through center, and then hug the elbows back in. Good. So we reach forward, extend out, stretching the chest, come back to center, and hug in. And then how many reps are you going to do? We're doing 10 reps of these. Uh -huh. And Al, this is really important because it's helping us be able to swing our arms with better posture right. while we're walking. Is balance the upper part of this body. Too? Balance is we're engaging the core here. So belly button pulls in towards the spine. Uh -huh. And then we do this move, you know, 10 times, like I said. Right. And then we move on to the next exercise. Okay, what's the next one? All right, so the next exercise is for our lower body, specifically the outer hip, to help us with that stability. So I've got our modification people over here. Uh -huh. You're going to be doing a side leg lift. Okay. All right, so we lift that leg out to the side. And then for the full version, we're doing a side lunge and coming to center. So let's everyone do it together. Here we go. Side lunge oh, and center. Side lunge. Good. And center. Our modifiers over here, if you have knee issues, hip issues, if your bones or joints just feel creaky, mm -hmm. I want you to do those leg lifts over here and then do the side lunge only if your knees and back feel okay. And okay. again, 10 of these on each side. Right. And then we move on to the next exercise. Next one. Are you ready to get down on the ground? I don't think so. <laughs> I can All get right. down, I just can't get back okay. up again. That's, that's been the big problem. <laughs> All right, so the last exercise is for the skirt. core. Okay. <laughs> We're going to hug the knees in, uh -huh. squeeze the inner thighs together. Good. Slowly roll down, abs pull in. Pretend okay. like someone's punching you in the stomach. Good. Yikes. Hold this here for a modification. Step two is lifting the legs up and holding on underneath the legs. Uh -huh. That's step two. Step three is the full V-sit right here. What do you think? Oh, that's fantastic. <laughs> I love watching you all do that. <laughs> Guns giving these people a hand, huh? Uh, and, and again, 10 reps. 10 reps. Hold for 10 seconds, 10 uh -huh. times, and then move on to the next ab exercise. And then in the in the in the program, how often do we do this? Is it like every other day? Yes, we're doing every other day strength training. We want to give our muscles time to recover. So uh -huh. you continue with the 20 minutes a day of walking. But in lieu of walking every other day, you can do this 20 minute strength training routine. All right, Stephanie, thank you. And thank you, ladies. Woo! These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No, do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Allie Jackson now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. 
Now we're back with Consumer Confidential for the August 1st day, a new <laughs> month meaning new deals. And here to help us figure out what we need to buy, our senior investigative and consumer correspondent, Vicki Wynn. Vicki, good morning. Hi, good morning. morning. To buy and how to save money. That's, That's right. Always. Especially right given that we've got this inflation rate that's yeah. still up there. Uh, so what are we looking for? And what, what's the big deals we're looking for? Al, for so long, there's been such high demand for so many things. And finally, things are slowing down a little bit because of inflation and the mm -hmm. price hikes, because of the rising interest rates. People are pumping their brakes a little bit. And also, all the supply chain issues I've been telling you about, mm -hmm. well, we've all caught up. All those things that were stuck on the right. ships and out in the ports, Good. they're now sitting in warehouses okay. at stores like Target, Macy's, so they want Lowe's, Home Depot. They're trying to push that stuff out. So if it comes to clothing, that's really good. The furniture we were all trying yes. to get last year, you can get it this year. Huh. People aren't trying to feather their nests anymore. So those items with the home goods, all deeply discounted, but you've got to go into the stores regionally to see what's on sale. Mm -hmm. The other thing that really wasn't very uh, affected by inflation, live entertainment. So concert tickets, yeah. movie theater mm -hmm. tickets, this is a great time to kind of enjoy the last few weeks of summer and get out, maybe see that concert you've been wanting to go see because prices didn't go up. Oh, Speaking of summer, any specific deals on, on spe like clothes that are made for summer or products that are summer specific? Outdoor furniture, right now is the time to buy. Earlier this season, we bought like a little bistro set, a table and two mm -hmm. chairs from Wayfair. $220. I went and checked it last night. $130. Oh, That's $100 now, off the same that, as that. Can you call the the, the consumer? The, you the can. You can see? ask for a price adjustment. Some companies are excellent about it, but this was a couple months ago, uh -huh. and so I'm not going to do that. But yes, if it had happened in the last two weeks, I'd be on the phone. Like, excuse right. me, but I'd like to get that discount, please. Um, so that's one thing. Swimsuits. So I don't know if you do this for your kids. I actually do. You buy now for next year. You sort of oh, guesstimate yes. their size, but right now you find deep discounts on swimwear and things like that. Mm -hmm. Also, all the gardening stuff. Lawnmower, if you're in the market, anything that has to do with garden tools, this is the time to buy, okay. for sure. And you mentioned, so in, in uh, season produce there. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Farmers Everything that's happening, and... support your local farmers at the <laughs> farmer's markets, all those veggies and fruits, and if you can, freeze them that's or right. can them. Get a vacuum them. sealer, yeah. baby. Vacuum sealer or pickle. You've got to, they've got to find you like somebody that you, <laughs> to get on that. Because every time we talk about fruits and vegetables, vacuum seal. you're on it. Uh, so, okay, so with, you know, the end of summer, comes back to school. There's actually a survey by Deloitte that says people are planning on spending about $600 yes. on back to school supplies. So how can we save money in that area? 600 bucks. And then the National Retail Federation is saying families are expecting to spend an average of 864 mm. when you factor in all of the kids. It's a big chunk of change. Mm -hmm. Back to school season is only second to the holiday shopping season wow. in terms of how much you consumers need new clothes, have to spend. You need new products. You Backpacks, need those lunch boxes, that's not cheap. So the first piece of advice, shop your own closet. Go back to all the stuff the kids brought home in mm -hmm. May and June. Are those colored pencils barely used? What about the crayons? Right. What about the composition book that they yes. have like seven of that only yes. like the first 20 pages are used? Use those things first. That's better for your budget. It's more eco-friendly. Sure. And list the help of grandparents, aunts and uncles who mm -hmm. may want to contribute. Maybe they want to buy that backpack for your kids this That's year. Shop towards the end of the season. You may have less selection, but the markdowns will be steeper. Mm -hmm. And then call your teacher, email your teacher. Do they really need five glue sticks? Do they really need all of these things at the very beginning of the year? Can you spread out those purchases? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't underestimate secondhand stores, especially for teenagers. Okay. Denim is so expensive. And if you go to these secondhand stores, Plato's Closet, Buffalo Exchange, even your local thrift stores like the Goodwills, you can get a lot of great things mm -hmm. for a fraction of what they'd cost okay. you at the mall. Okay, what about the things we shouldn't buy now? Okay, so we generally want to wait on electronics. Yes, there will be computer and laptop sales for back to school, but if you really don't need that right now, Black Friday mm -hmm. is your best bet. And then what do I always say about buying clothes? You buy... Last mm. season's clothes. This is that. We're like, like what do you say? We don't know. It's a test. It's a test. We failed. So I was like, wasn't want, that like BOGO or right, FOMO or they're all of the Bopas? Buy online. Yes. Yes. No, this is if don't buy your fall clothes right now if you don't need them. You should be buying your summer clothes. Like tank tops right now oh. are deeply discounted. So if you need the fall clothes, you buy those That's in a winter. Mindset. You it's know, a mindset, to, to start absolutely. Shopping like that. Oh, so yes. I should be buying summer clothes? Summer clothes. Right now, summer clothes is and out. And so then save them. Buy early and save them for next year. There you go. All right, exactly. Great advice. Thank okay. you. <laughs> Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. And what do you love about fatherhood? The chaos. The learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now.
Welcome back to you today. We had a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. They're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. The day's biggest political stories with trusted insight now and expert analysis now. A daily look at the politics behind the headlines. Meet the Press Now, streaming weekdays at 4 p.m. on NBC News Now. Hallie Jackson Now, weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. Today is National Girlfriends Day, and we never miss a chance to celebrate friendship around here. And neither does Liz Norwood Eveland, who started Girlfriends Movement, and it all began with a simple Facebook post. We're going to chat with Liz in a moment, but first, check out her story. Women share a lot when they're with their girlfriends. We're there to support them and comfort them. Liz Norwood Eveland knows the value of having girlfriends by your side. So when she moved to Gilbert, Arizona in 2017, she was looking for ways to make new friends. I posted in a Facebook group, does anybody want to join me at the movies? And 12 women showed up. I did not expect that kind of turnout. It was just great to meet a handful of women that were going through the same things. Seeing that other women were also looking for ways to connect, Liz created the Facebook group Gilbert Girlfriends. Liz had put on a site, hey, is there any groups for girls in Gilbert? And I said, no, you create it, I'll join. Mary Beth Caputo became the second member and she and Liz immediately clicked. I met Liz and it's like, oh my God, we like similar people. She was just bubbly and she's energetic. She's been there since day one and, um, you know, she's a big part of my life. Since then, Gilbert Girlfriends has grown to more than 17,000 members. And Liz now admins more than 70 girlfriend groups across North America, helping thousands of women make lasting friendships, including best friends, Kathy Nolan and Rebecca Coy. I moved here from California and I came in a very depressive state of mind. Kathy was there for me. She is my bestest friend, not just my best friend, but my bestest friend. When somebody connects with the right people, they're gonna be your cheerleader, they'll cry with you, and then you'll go do some fun, crazy stuff. For Liz, creating spaces for strong bonds to form is the heart of what the girlfriends groups do. They host local events for women to meet and have fun. She loves making it an opportunity for women to connect, it's amazing. It's totally enriched my life. I just want to continue to grow groups across the country because I think every woman needs to have girlfriends. Liz, we love we you. We love you. <laughs> oh Thank my you. Gosh. Thank I, you so much. Were you shocked? I mean, you put out a message yeah. mm -hmm. and you got all of these replies. It's turned into a movement. It has turned into a movement and it's been very fulfilling for me and for gals across the country. I mean, so many people uh, just don't, they move to a new place, they don't have any friends. Yeah, and you exactly. always wonder, how am I gonna find, how am I gonna find? You exactly. probably thought a couple of people would show up. But right. could you can you believe where it started five years ago and where it is today? No, and it's very exciting and very essential during, you know, when we were all homebound yeah, yeah. during COVID. Yeah, it was really nice to be able to have that communication. Yeah. Do you know that there are studies that say that connection yeah. is just as important as food and water yeah. for us to survive? And what you've done is connect a group of women across our country. What do people say to you? I hear stories every day, you know, mm -hmm. about connections or how they had moved someplace and they weren't really um, excited about it until they found the group and kind of started making their friends and they were able to um, have a sense of purpose where they were living at the time, you know, with well, their group. I think it's so cool, all these people. I loved how you lit up when you saw your friend. What was her name again? Mary Beth. Mary Beth. <laughs> well, we thought it'd be kind of fun if she came here today. What? <laughs> Mary Beth! <laughs> Come on out! You're kidding. <laughs>
Surprise! Oh, now I'm crying. Oh, <laughs> she literally oh, got married. She goes, that's, 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 that's her. That's Wait my minute. bestie. You had no idea? No, I had no idea. How did you even get here? I've been so sneaky for like the whole week. Oh my God, this is so nice. Mary, what does your friendship mean to each other? Oh my gosh. I mean, since the group she created was everybody needs somebody, right? Yeah. And then she created the group, and I said, if you create it, I'm going to join. Yep. And the rest is history. We've gone so many places, and she's she's such a go-getter and a motivator. So she's awesome. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Well, so cute. Liz, there were a couple other girlfriends that want to celebrate you, too, so we have a little message. Oh, Take my gosh. Oh, my God. <laughs> I wanted to say thank you to you for all you have done for thousands of women around the country. You kindly and selflessly give so much to so many. Your girlfriends is just not a group to me. It's a true sisterhood. This group has really changed my world, and I have so many new friendships and experiences because of it. I don't know what I would have done without Liz and my girlfriends, and I thank her every day for creating such a wonderful, wonderful legacy. I appreciate everything you've done for us. And this has been a life-changing last five years, and I look forward to more. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The lives you've changed. Yes. That, what, is, amazing. Yeah, what does that mean to see all these girls? It's just been great. And yesterday I got some messages from friends, and it's just been wonderful to um, <laughs> share, you know, with them. And they're just so excited, and, and, and they're grateful that they uh -huh. have that connection now. And, you know, they've made their group of friends, and it's just... It's just been great. Well, Liz and Mary Beth, since y'all now are officially on a girl's trip, yeah. I didn't know if y'all know that. <laughs> yeah. Y'all are in New York. Jibs wants to treat you to lunch at their restaurant in New York's Hudson Yard so you two can catch oh up. Y'all are going to go so to a cool. beautiful lunch, a enjoy a little seafood, hang wow. out, hang oh, out and have wow. to make some more memories. Oh, oh my God. God. Thank y'all so much. Thanks for coming. Yes, yeah, thank you. Oh my God. Thank you for all yes. of the goodness yes. you're doing. All right, hope you come back tomorrow on Today. We've got another great show, including Bob Odenkirk, who will be here. Cool, we'll chat with him. We can't wait to see you guys then. See ya. Ready to pull the stem out? Watch, you go like this. Just bend it. <laughs> That's a funny sound, huh? Peace. Hi everybody, welcome to Dylan Dishes Cooking with Cal on Today All Day. This week it's Taco Tuesday and we are showing you our favorite ways to turn any Tuesday into a fiesta with my steak tacos and turkey veggie quesadillas. And of course, any taco night wouldn't be complete without a great salsa. So don't miss a bonus recipe, my zesty mango salad, which can be made mild or spicy, however you like it. All right, so planning meals for an entire week can be so challenging, so stressful. One way to make meal prep easier is to give each night its own theme. I find that when you have a theme, it's easy to program your favorite dishes to kind of match that menu. So our first recipe is for steak tacos. For this steak marinade, you're gonna need garlic, cilantro, jalapeno, orange, lime, vinegar, oil, and salt. And for the homemade salsa to top these tacos with, you'll need tomatoes, onions, garlic, cilantro, jalapeno, olive oil, lime, and salt. So I've got this split up into our different ingredients. This is all going to be for the marinade, and this is all for our pico de gallo and our toppings and everything once we actually make the tacos. So, here we go. Let's get started. So what we're going to do first is make a marinade for our skirt steak. We want it to marinate for about two to eight hours. Any longer than that, the steak's gonna to turn to mush. Oh, I got my hug, I love my hugs. There's a fancy way you can make this with a mortar and pestle. I just like to throw it all in the food processor. It's not as fancy, but it gets the job done. Can I do it with a lock? Sure. Oh. Can I show you a trick? Mm -hmm. I did a great job. All right, throw all that in there. These are awesome garlics. Say Chanel, this is jalapeno business. Say Chanel, this is jalapeno business. Cool. That's Chanel's favorite joke. Let's throw in some cilantro. Mmm. Mmm. Throw this in there. Ooh, yummy, yummy, yummy. Can I? I can't taste it. No, 
want to taste it? Here. I'm tasting the juice. Okay. You can have that one. Um, I'll do the juices. Then I'm um, can I blend it? Mm-hmm. I'm I'm the blender. Vinegar? Mm -hmm. Smell mm -hmm. that. Maybe I only have like two tablespoons left. Oil, one, two, three, four, five, six. Six. Yeah. Press it again. All right, so we have our marinade, and we are going to pour it all over the steak, and then just let it sit for the next several hours. Ooh. Let's cover this up and we'll pop it in the fridge, and then we can make our salsa. Just need a couple of big chops because we're going to let the food processor do all the work. Do onions make you cry? Yeah. Oh, man. Did you remember your trick? pink color but that's because of the food processor. Yeah. You gonna clean this mess for me? It this is a big one. <laughs> We're gonna let this sit and all the flavors come together. We've got the steak marinating and all those flavors are gonna come together and later we'll fire up the grill pan and we'll make our steak tacos, right? Okay. Okay, so we have had the steak marinating all day long, right? It's a little bit closer to dinner time now, right? Are you hungry? It's already dinner time. So we should finish this. Yeah, we have to hurry. Okay. <laughs> I love that sound. <laughs> Can I have pepper? Sure. Yeah. Okay, that's why it, I wanted to do it. Who <laughs> said the pepper? Should we make some guacamole? Whoa. So you'll notice if you look at the meat, it all goes that way, like all the lines are kind of going that way. So we want to cut this way against the grain so that it's nice and tender. Otherwise, it'll be too hard to chew. All right, should we try it? Um, how I, I can't do it on the phone. Oh, yes. What do you think? Yummy. Do um, you like tacos? I want another one. The next recipe on our menu for Taco Tuesday is a veggie and turkey quesadilla. The secret to this recipe is to really just use whatever you have around the house. Just open the fridge, pull out whatever veggies or meat you have on hand. And here's how Cal and I made our easy cheesy quesadillas. Do you love quesadillas? Mm -hmm. Yum, yum, yum. Ready to get started? Mm -hmm. Okay. Why do you like quesadillas? Because they, you can have cheese in them. Is it just a means of eating cheese? Um, yeah. <laughs> you did pretty good, that's perfect. Okay, let's cut up some zucchini and we'll try it again. Cut it, I'll give you some strips to cut, okay? Yeah, what's your favorite food? Fried rice. Fried rice. Maybe we'll make fried rice one day. What do you think? While you do that, I'm going to peel the carrot, okay? okay. Who picks mushrooms? Farmers. Oh, for us? Mm-hmm. So you like mushrooms? Ah, uh, of course I do. Ready to pull the stem out? Watch, you go like this. Just bend it over. That's a funny sound, huh? Nice. Slice them up nice and thin like this. Guess what time it is? Huh? 
It's onion time. So I'm gonna do this onion real quick, okay? See you later. Oh, that's a gross onion. What? What's in that gross onion? Look at that. All right, no onion. Can I see mama? Wow. I know. It wasn't that hot. Is that a little salt and pepper? It's turkey. Oh. We're going to use this instead of beef tonight because we had beef last Did night. Did someone catch that turkey? I think they caught the turkey, yeah. Today is now a podcast available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. These are our missing daughters and sons. We need anyone who saw something to come forward. She was wearing a black jacket, a black top. I'm going to bring my son home alive. Dateline Missing in America. Listen now wherever you get your podcasts. From New Orleans. Nice to really spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? Now tonight with Joshua Johnson, streaming weeknights at 8 on NBC News Now. From Brooklyn, we're next to the subway station. The state's reservoirs are alarmingly low. War will pass them by. Tonight, I interviewed Secretary of Transportation Pete Buttigieg about the ongoing delays. You seem to be pointing the finger at the airlines. They're pointing the finger back. Mr. Secretary, when is this going to get better? What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. What's for dinner? Yeah, yeah. Tacos? Can you say taco? Yeah. Ollie, can you say taco? Taco. <laughs> and cheese? cheese? Ollie, Ollie, can you say cheese? Cheese. <laughs> Ollie, can you say beef? Beef. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome back to Dylan Dishes, Cooking with Cal. So you just heard Ollie say it. It's Taco Tuesday. And this week we're showing you our favorite ways to turn any night into a fiesta. Now, of course, this theme night wouldn't be complete without chips and salsa. And sometimes I like to mix it up with something sweet. So I recently taught Calvin how to make my mango salad that doubles as a salsa. I love this recipe because it's really versatile. And for this recipe, you're going to need mango, shallots, red bell pepper, cilantro, and lime juice. Sour. Not sour. Not sour. <laughs> Juicy. Juicy and sweet. You were just teasing. All right, that's enough mango, right? Mm -hmm. So can you help me put all the mango in the bowl? This is all my pile. That's your this, pile? This is your tiny bit pile. I can do this bit pile? Yeah. Okay. 
<laughs> Do you know what this is? No. Oh, yeah, onion. It does look like an onion. This is actually called a shallot. Wait, it's gonna hurt my eyes. Okay. It's gonna hurt my eyes? It's not gonna hurt your eyes, okay? What is this? Um, tomato, pepper. Oh. Squeeze it. A pepper? Why do you wanna keep squeezing? This is for the lime, silly goose. This is, that's a big strip. All right, let's put the red pepper in. What color is missing in here? Green. Green. Cilantro. Cilantro. <laughs> you can help me pick off some of these leaves, okay? Ew. Exposed to my own. He loves me. He loves me not. He loves me. He loves me not. Have you ever heard of that before? No. I don't think so. Have you ever tasted cilantro? No. Nice pop of color. Pop. I'm sure I'm strong, man. So you could try to squeeze it first on your own. Squeeze and twist. Squeeze and twist. I do the other lime, okay, Mom? I don't know if you need the other lime. Let's add a little salt and pepper. Yes, sir! Because the salt brings out the sweetness. And we'll do a little pepper. Brings out the sweetness? <laughs> For all these recipes, go to today.com slash Dylan Dishes. And I dropped the noodles, my bad. Five second rule, but just to be safe, I'm gonna put them in the dishwasher. But I mean, other times, if I was on national television, I'd still go by the five second rule. I'm Matthew Smith, and this is Kids in the Kitchen. When I really started cooking was when I was seven years old. That's when I really got into the love of cooking. My family's Vietnamese heritage definitely influences my um, cooking style. My Bell Y uses some specific ingredients that I still use to this day. I've kind of looked into those ingredients from starting to see things on the internet and starting to kind of be like, oh, lemongrass, for example, is actually used in Vietnamese cooking. And then from there, digging a little deeper, I actually learned, oh, that was the ingredient that my grandma might have had used in one of her recipes. I didn't really have an exact game plan, but I just like kind of loved the experience. I think that the best thing that I learned from participating on the show was not something that I realized immediately, it's actually something that I've come to realize over the years, is that food has so many memories behind it because when I think about it, I don't remember every single dish I made. I don't remember if I finished it in the correct time period. I don't even remember if the judges liked it or not. What I remember are those 23 other kids on the show who were just such a blast and the memories and going out to eat with them and living the life in LA. That's what I remember the most. At the start of this pandemic, um, I had a lot of time off from remote learning, so I decided to cook for 100 days straight. You know, first it was Italy, then it was Asia, then it was a good dessert route, but my dad did remember it as 100 days of cleaning. I'm still 11 years old, so some of my favorite hobbies, I think, are definitely playing the piano. I love playing downstairs ninja, gotta like boom, 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 boom. I think my favorite equipment is probably just the rings because you could just kind of climb on them and I love reading, you know? So my advice for adults who are not great cooks is try to just see 
the other joys of it because cooking isn't just about making the food. So just find a part of that that you like to enjoy the process as you go along with it. Welcome to my kitchen. Today, I'm going to be making my Baowai inspired crispy chicken ramen bowl with soy sauce eggs. I love this dish because it reminds me of Baowai because of all the Vietnamese flavors. I'm here at my ramen noodle station. I'm gonna be needing 120 grams of bread flour. I'm also gonna need um, 60 milliliters of warm water. And this is so we can uh, dissolve um, our teaspoon of baked baking soda. And finally, we're just gonna need a pinch of salt to give a depth of flavor. I'm gonna dissolve my teaspoon of baked baking soda. So now, in order to get this all incorporated into our bread flour, um, I'm just gonna kind of make a small well here, similar to how I would do for uh, pasta. I'm just gonna add in my water mixture. For our depth of flavor, just kind of making our taste buds think a little more, we're gonna be adding in um, our pinch of salt. As you can really see here, our dough is really starting to form. And now I feel like this is all kids' favorite part about cooking, but I'm gonna ditch the fork and I'm gonna get in there with my hands, just kind of starting to add some over since it's very gluey still. We're just kind of starting to add flour and then majestically we're gonna really get a dough out of here. And for kneading, there's really two different ways. I kind of like to use the ball of my hand and start kind of like kneading it this way, but you can also put it back upon itself, which creates more layers and spreads the moisture throughout. I'm gonna take my rolling pin and we're now gonna start rolling this out into a little square to spread more of that more uh, moisture and all. We're gonna cover it with the saran wrap and rest it for about an hour. If you wanna do it overnight, you can just refrigerate it and take it out in the morning. So now we're gonna be getting started at our chicken station to make our crispy chicken, the star of the show. But um, for this, you're just gonna need two um, skin, um, skin on chicken thighs, as well as some coarse kosher sea salt and some grapeseed oil. So now it's time to score our chicken. Um, this is just by kind of making small cuts within the skin and not the actual poultry. This is gonna ensure that we get a really nice crispy chicken breast. And it will, and will also make sure it crackles up. Now using my other hand, I'm just gonna salt it, making sure to get into all of those uh, cracks as well. I have some grapeseed oil, which is perfect for cooking at high temperatures. So I'm now just gonna add in our chicken breasts that we made, uh, chicken thighs, my bad. And we're gonna put them skin down and let them cook for about seven to 10 minutes. And you wanna cook it to an internal temperature of 165 degrees. It says that it is an internal temperature of 100 and 66, so I think we did our job, everybody. So now I'm just gonna put this out onto a plate. We're gonna let that rest over there. So we don't wanna get rid of all of that goodness on the bottom of the pot just yet, because that's gonna be the base for our broth. I will definitely say while making this, there's a lot of influence from my uh, Bawai's cooking this dish more, such as the ginger. It was something she used very often. It's so small when it's roasted. It just gives that magical and kind of like pop acidic flavor in the back of your throat. So kind of working all throughout the mouth. So now to this pot of chicken goodness, I have uh, my shiitake mushrooms, about a fourth to a half a cup. And to that, I'm gonna add in my sliced ginger. To release that ginger flavor, I really find that by cooking it over low heat um, and by slicing it, it really releases the flavor even more. And now we're gonna add in the minced ginger since it's we just want it to disintegrate, but we don't want it to burn. You know when this is ready, and I find it's just because you can really smell that ginger coming alive and stuff. So, that's how I know this is all ready and the mushrooms are a little wilted. I'm gonna add in my chicken stock. So now I'm gonna add in um, my small star anise. I feel like this um, leaves a hint of almost like a pho flavor, which has this very 
odd um, kind of smell to it, almost majestical if you were to have like a magic castle. But I'm also gonna add in some dried lemongrass. It doesn't have the acidity of fresh lemongrass, but it does give a really nice lemon flavor. So now we're gonna bring this mixture up to a boil and then we're gonna simmer it for 10 minutes to really let the flavors meld together before adding on almost another layer of seasonings. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Today is now a podcast, available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. You open the door for so many people. I love working with people. I did not do any of this by myself. Hello! Lizzo, you put a smile on yes. every single face. It feel like Christmas and my birthday or something. <laughs> Local meet Ukrainians who are defending their country one block at a time. When you were still in Kiev, could you hear the bombing? My name is Lester. And who's this? Welcome back to you today. We've got a lot to celebrate on this Wednesday morning. It's good to have you along with us. You don't know when your moment's coming, but when it does, you take it. Everybody's good, and that's it! From New Orleans. Nice to go spend some time with you. Appreciate it. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Hallie Jackson Now. Weekdays at 5 on NBC News Now. What do you love about fatherhood? The chaos, the learning. Is climate change one of your top priorities? What's your message to girls who want to make a difference in their own communities? Believe in yourself. Today is now a podcast. Available every morning. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. Live from Ukraine, from Uvalde, Texas, from Mayfield, Kentucky. To cover the news, you have to be in it. This is how so many towns and cities are protecting themselves. You can actually see they're pushing the gates open. Was there a school officer on campus? That's what we've been told. No. Do you remember any tornado as bad as this one? You look at this and you're thinking, we're not going to have power for weeks, if not months. Exactly. Every night, it's your news playlist. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. Top Story with Tom Yamas. Weeknights at 7 on NBC News Now. In order to accomplish these uh, soy sauce eggs, you're gonna need some eggs, sesame oil, some marin, as well as um, a good amount of soy sauce. The first thing you want to do is bring your salted water to a boil. We're gonna immediately add our eggs, and then you're gonna cook this for six and a half minutes. So now that my eggs are done cooking, I'm gonna put them in an ice bath. I'm gonna get started making the marinade. I'm gonna add in my two tablespoons of soy sauce. And then again, for that little bit of uh, stickiness slash sweetness, we're gonna add in our marin, about, two, uh, about a tablespoon or so, and then a bowl turn or a tablespoon of toasted sesame oil. It's time to peel um, our soft boiled eggs. Now we're gonna let our little babies rest. So now we are at our noodle station and we're here to continue preparing our dough. So um, I'm gonna get started rolling it by hand. Um, this is a lot more fun, um, but can also get a little messy too. And I'm just gonna put that on a well-floured surface using some bread flour as well. We're gonna go once, go twice, and then we're gonna start making cuts throughout. One, and then. We're gonna take it apart and you got a noodle. 
for the thickness, there's not like an exact thickness, but not as big as you would cut fettuccine, which is a little wider, but not as small as spaghetti. It, a lot of it's also trial and error, if I'm honest with you, but that's my favorite part about being a home cook. We're gonna cook these for four to five minutes so we get those tender springy noodles or otherwise known as all zansai. Now that our noodles are cooking, we are getting started um, to finish our broth. So now we're gonna add in that second layer of flavor. So to kind of help that lemongrass out a bit, we have two teaspoons of lemon juice, a little bit of soy sauce. I'm gonna add in some marin, a Japanese wine. Um, also some rice wine vinegar, and then a pinch of salt for again that depth of flavor. Some black pepper for a little bit of bitterness. That's all ready, and let's go check on our noodles. Those are nice and tender, so I'm just gonna scoop some out into a bowl. It's time to go head over to our broth station. So now we're gonna bring our noodles over and we're gonna add some of our delicious broth. This reminds me of my bao wai or my grandma's pho. Like I said earlier, although I love just when I'm with the food, I also love when I'm with my bao wai or my grandma. Hello, bao wai. I'm so excited to garnish one of my favorite dishes, but also be with my favorite person. Um, but I, I just want to kind of cut it around the bone, um, and so I'm going to probably cut it into three pieces. We got our scallions now, Bawai. I'm now also going to add in my soy sauce eggs, and now we're just going to cut it, Bawai, too. And wow, look at that runny egg yolk, Bawai. Isn't that just so satisfying? Now, Bawai, um, we're gonna get started placing our chicken. And I'll add in both of my eggs, topping it with some black sesame seeds for a little pop. We're just gonna garnish with these um, spring onions. All right, Bawai, here's the final product. And here it is. How do you think it looks, Bawai? Good? Nice. Mm, so good. But why? Do you like this dish? Yes, I love it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. But, eh, thank you. Well, I mean, thank you for teaching, like, just kind of being the inspiration to discovering my Asian heritage and making me so proud of that. So now we're going to continue digging in. I hope you guys enjoyed this recipe as much as I did, and thank you again for joining me. Good morning, rising toll. The loss of life mounts in Kentucky, including four children in one family. More rain and new flood watches issued overnight. There's nothing else left for us to lose. This morning, the National Guard using helicopters.